button. Father, we ask that you guide us this evening, that all our deliberations and decisions be according to your will and according to your plan for us in this world. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. Uh, first item, of course, is the approval of your agenda. There are no matters in the bullpen uh, for addition. I would note that as you adopt the agenda that we might want to do that with dropping the designation placeholder only for economic development matter under new business. There will be uh, at least one matter for consideration at that point in your meeting. Do I have a motion to approve our agenda with that drop? as recommended. All right, any discussion? Call the question. Six yes with Mr. McLaughlin not present. Thank you, next up is the board's consent agenda. The floor computer please. Consent agenda for this evening uh, consists of eight items. The last ninth item has been dropped. First is the approval of minutes from the April 4th, 2017 board meeting. Next is adoption of a resolution authorizing execution of the charter and local elected officials agreement for the Bay Consortium uh, under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Third is approval of a budget adjustment for uh, building safety uh, to fund a part-time clerk, $1,941 to come from the Code Compliance Fund. Item four is approval of a Dominion Virginia Power easement for tax map 25A8. This is to extend and install electric service to county-owned property at the Railroad Museum over in the industrial, Bowman Industrial Park. Next is approval of an REC easement for tax map Tax map number 75A37 to relocate underground utilities and then an existing service light at the Berkeley Convenience Center. Item six is to authorize public hearing to allow a Verizon easement along county property for purposes ex of extending service. <coughs> this is in the Six Lakes West subdivision. Uh, item seven is a grant application request for the 2017 18 school resource officer and school security officer incentive grant program. The total grant um, application would be for $31,915. And if approved, if we're awarded the grant, there would be a local match of $18,085. Eighth is a provision of uh, broadband services memorandum of understanding. This would be authorized to execute the MOU for the um, Central Rappahannock Regional Library operation at the Belmont Community Center. And um, again, the last item is stricken. That's been uh, moved to your next meeting. So the eight, on, eight items are your consent agenda. Any board member that would like to pull any item from the consent agenda? I have a motion to approve. Okay. Call the question. Six yes. Thank you. That brings us to public presentations. Amy, has anyone signed up? Yes, sir. Let me run briefly through the guidelines for public presentations. Public presentations are an opportunity for citizens to present matters you believe deserve the board's attention. These presentations are not part of a public hearing. Sign up to speak at each public hearing is separate. Public presentations are one-way com comments from citizens to the Board of Supervisors, this is not a forum for dialogue or debate. To make a public presentation, please sign up on the provided uh, sign-up sheet and please print clearly. Come to the lectern when your name is called. Clearly state your name, address, and voting district for our record. Address your comments directly to the board. State whether you're speaking on your own behalf, in which case you'll have three minutes to speak, or on behalf of a group, 
uh, in which case you'll have five minutes to speak. Public presentations shall not be used to address matters subject to public hearings or to make political campaign speeches, private advertisements, or personal attacks. Your written comments are always welcomed by the Board of Supervisors. Amy, who do we have? Jackie Williams, followed by Reverend Michael Hirsch. Good evening. I am Jackie Williams, and I live at 9410 Everett Court in the Berkeley District. Recent events raised questions about the willingness to work together within Spotsylvania for the benefit of our citizens. It appears the school board is trying to create a hostile environment, and I am concerned about what appears to be heavy-handed and repressive actions on the part of members of the Spotsylvania schools. At the end of the April 10th school board meeting, the chairman called a point of order when the same school board member that went on the tour wanted to speak. She said that it was inappropriate for board members to make comments, but just prior to this, others on the school board congratulated a board member on an upcoming birth of another grandchild. Why then was there an attempt to silence this board member, especially because all he was doing was thanking the Board of Supervisors for additional money? What were they trying to suppress? A speech therapist who works for Spotsylvania School System commented that the chairman of the CBRC has nothing else to do but pick apart the budget. That is part of the mission of the CBRC, to critically examine county and school budgets. She has commented about supposed meetings some supervisors attend. This is a continuation of her constant insults. Is she disciplined for these insults? No, she's encouraged to rage, rage and will continue this behavior. Can firemen or maintenance workers do this? No, they would be disciplined. The behavior of this one teacher makes the whole system look bad. Yes, it was discussed that we be civil to one another during board meetings, but do we have rules for some people and not others? or insulting county volunteers on committees, is disrespecting a fellow school board member publicly at a school board meeting. What message is this sending to our citizens? Is this intimidation? And will citizens fear voting on election day? I thank you for your time. Reverend Michael Hirsch. Good evening, uh, Chairman Ross. I'm the Reverend Michael Hirsch, residing at 200 McConkie Street. 22401, I serve as chairman of the Fredericksburg, Virginia Patriots and have a statement. One of the core principles of the Patriots is to uphold the rule of law. Earlier today, I sent two email messages to this board as follows. There is, however, one uh, edit that I will make known. Uh, dear members, uh, uh, the first was entitled, No School Employees on the CBRC. Dear members of the Spotsylvania Board of Supervisors, having read the bylaws of the Citizen Budget Review Committee, Spotsylvania County Article 2, the committee section 2.1 composition, the CBRC shall be made up of seven members with one member being appointed by each supervisor and approved by the BOS as a whole. A member shall be a citizen of Spotsylvania County and the letter I sent had shall, but most recently we have may not be a current employee of the county administration or the school system. I believe it is wrong to allow county employees and particularly a current employee of the Spotsylvania school system to serve on the CBRC. Respectfully, Reverend Michael Hirsch, Chairman, Patriots. The second is entitled, Follow the CBRC Charter. And right now I'm live at your website Spotsylvania.va.us Citizen Budget Review Committee Charter. The public understands this. <clears throat> Follow the CBRC Charter. Dear members of the Spotsylvania Board of Supervisors, having read the Citizen Budget Review Committee Charter, Article 3, Organization, Paragraph 3, members of the committee should be citizens with prior expertise in public or private sector budgeting who are not current employees with Spotsylvania County or Spotsylvania Public Schools. 
citizens should represent a cross-section of communities of interest within the county, i.e. suburban, rural, business, etc. Again, I believe it is wrong to appoint a current employee with the Spotsylvania Public Schools. So we have a question, I suppose, which would be, have any of you ever played Mother May I? I have grandchildren, and when they play with their grandmother, it's Mother May I. When mother says, may not, you stand still or you lose the game. So the question is, can you supersede the charter granted by the Board of Supervisors by an amendment to the bylaws that is in contradiction to the charter? Under the rule of law, I believe the answer would be no, you may not. Again, may not. So if we have a member of the board making a recommendation, and then as we the citizens go to the public website and find the charter saying not to be an employee, let me quote it again, who are not current employees. We have to ask ourselves, is it a bait and switch? Are we coming here to make public commentary on outdated web pages, which is a disgraceful use of the taxpayer's money, and a poor, no, not a poor service, it is a disservice to the citizens to think that they can look at their county website, find the current information, particularly when this issue was raised two weeks ago. So where are we today? I hope that the board will act within the charter that we see the public being presented with and proceed uh, lawfully. To ask someone who is always coming before this board, as history will show itself if you look at your archives, the individual under consideration is never scarce to be heard before, before this board. But to grant that position in a dereliction of your own charter, so I think it would be wise to consider amending the charter and proceeding lawfully or changing what is on the website. Again, thank you all for your service and God bless you. There are no other citizens signed up to speak. Is there anybody that did not sign up that would like to speak at this time? Come on, you can come forward. Sign up out, out front. Uh, my name is Rick Lanham, 11201 Cloverdale Street, Chancellor District. Um, I was here back in 2014 um, to talk about a walking trail on Thornbur Thornbury Estates. Um, then I requested to have it removed from the plans. Then in, it's come to my uh, attention. Sir? That, yes. Excuse me, that is the subject of a public hearing. Okay. Tonight that will be starting shortly, and your okay, comments would appropriately be made. No worries here. at all. Yep. So, um, so there are two public hearings. There will be time to speak on both of those, and now the public presentation time is a time to speak on anything but those, so that it's not a duplicative process. So is there anybody else that would like to speak at this time that didn't sign up for something that's not being addressed in the public hearings? Uh, work session part of public hearing? If it's work session, under work session, is that part of the public hearing? No, the public hearing is defined as okay. two, two separate things. Good evening. Thank My name is Jean Bergeron. I reside in Kingswood subdivision, and I am in the Battlefield District. I am here to read a letter from Don Knapper, who is unable to be here tonight. Good evening, gentlemen. I would like to address a few of the comments made at the last meeting. Unfortunately, I have conferences from 5.30 until 7 tonight and am unable to be here in person. First, I wish to start by stating my reasons for wanting to serve on the CBRC. I sat and listened to Jeremiah's presentation in February and realized that I could answer a good deal of these questions, especially about the band instruments. As I have spent seven years as a band parent, four of those years as an officer of the Massaponics Band Parent Association, as well and was on the school boards or school's budget committee for eight years. I saw a need in the county where I could help and asked to join the committee. I am capable of wearing many different hats and have done so for many years. I have volunteered in many positions where I thought I could be of help. I was a chairman of the covenants committee 
for Lee's Hill for eight years, held many positions for the Massaponics Band's Parents Association, served as a grade level chair and as association leader in my building and vice president for my professional association. It is an association such as the American Medical Association or the Police Association. As you know, we do not collectively bargain. The CBRC is an advisory board as I understand it. How I would have undue influence over the budget just by being on that committee, I do not know. As far as finding anyone unbiased to be on the committee, I believe that is not possible. Everyone on that committee has a reason for being on it, and it is biased against some part of the budget. Lastly, why can't employees be members of the committee? We have the expertise to answer many of the questions asked. I think it would be a great benefit to the committee to have a firefighter, a police officer, and a teacher on it. I will watch your meeting later online. I would like to address one thing that was made by the previous speaker, which I find very ironic considering he does not even live in this county. But I go to the members of the CBRC and First Sergeant Timothy Briner, I believe is how you pronounce his name, is one of the members. Pretty sure he works for the county as a police officer, as a sheriff. So for him to say that, I find ironic. If you're going to address, if you're going to allow one employee of the county on the board, there's no reason why you can't let another. You know, I, there are some things I agree with, there are some things I don't, but I feel you need to take and give it good consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else that did not sign up to speak that would like to speak at this time? Okay, we'll close public presentations, go into public hearings, I believe. We, well, yes, we're late for public hearings, we'll do board reports later. Good evening, Wanda. The first item is CA 17-0003, this is a zoning amend amendment pertaining to the reconstruction of existing electrical transmission lines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. May I have the floor computer, please? The code amendment before you this evening has to do with a section of the zoning ordinance related to the alteration or enlargement of a non-conforming structure, and specifically this evening, it relates to electrical transmission lines. There is a pending project that this code amendment relates to, so what I'm gonna first do is talk about the actual code amendment to the zoning ordinance, and then to give a little context, talk about the Dominion Power Project uh, that is pending. The proposal before you this evening is an amendment that allows for the reconstruction of an existing electrical transmission line within an existing easement, and this May, be, may occur administratively if it's done in substantial conformance with that existing transmission line, its structures. The two main provisions related to that to define what is substantial conformance is that the average height of the new structures may vary from the height of the old structures by plus or minus 15%, so it, it allows for the structures to be generally um, a similar height to what they are now and the location of the new structures may vary from the existing structures by up to 60 feet. And this is longitudinally. It's not side to side in the easement because there are requirements related to how close these lines can be to uh, trees. So um, it is not side to side in the easement, but longitudinally. The Planning Commission held their public hearing on April 5th. They do recommend approval of the code amendment. Um, and staff does recommend approval. This does have an ordinance number, number 23-169. The pending project is the Four Rivers Fredericksburg Transmission Line Rebuild. And this is a Dominion Virginia Power project. It runs through the county from Caroline County up through Spotsylvania to Fredericksburg. 
It, it begins down in Hanover County. It's approximately 34 miles long. It's on the eastern side of the county. The existing easement is 200 feet wide, and it's about 8.2 miles within the county, crossing about 213 parcels. And one, excuse me, I'm confused. Could you just circle with the pointer where the 8.2 miles is and that's Here, the county line Here's the there. county line at Caroline. Thank you. And here's the city of Fredericksburg line. Thank you. <coughs> to provide a little more background on this line, the easement and the line date to 1957, so it, it's 60 years old, nearing the end of its useful life. As I mentioned, there are reliability criteria that they are proposing to upgrade the line to meet. Um, the line having been installed in 1957 predates the zoning ordinance when ca which came into effect in 1973, so the line is considered to be a legally non-conforming use, meaning that uh, it can exist, but in order to upgrade it, replace it, it would require a special use permit under our current ordinance. Uh, Hanover and Caroline both treated the upgrade administratively and it's actually under construction. The city of Fredericksburg is also <coughs> considering an amendment to their ordinance at the same time that we are uh, to also make this administrative approval within some very narrow uh, parameters just as our ordinance provides. The image on the left is the existing set of lines. Uh, the one on the left side here, this is as though we're looking north at the line. Uh, the one on the left is not proposed to change. This is already a metal structure. <coughs> the existing one on the right is the 115 kV circuit, and this one is proposed to be replaced throughout that 8.2 miles. Um, the image here on the right uh, shows that upgrade. Again, 115 kV. Uh, the, the biggest change is that the approximate average height currently is 62 feet. Uh, it'll go up about four feet on average. It, of course, topography will dictate some, some areas the towers will actually be shorter and some it will go more than four feet, but it can't exceed 15% of the height currently. The, um, the other main change will be that these will be replaced with metal structures. They're currently wooden structures. And here is a photograph, again, looking north. Uh, you can see the metal structures. They're already, uh, for the most part, taller than the wooden ones. Uh, so you would expect that the wooden ones, once replaced, would be very similar to these metal structures. Uh, so staff is recommending approval of this administrative process. It will be a more efficient permitting process than going through the special use process to allow the reconstruction of a, a transmission line within an existing easement that will aid the regional uh, electrical system. Uh, and so staff is recommending approval. The Planning Commission has as well. There are representatives from Dominion here this evening if you have any questions about their specific project. Thank you. Does the board have any questions? Mr. Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wanda, that last picture you had up there was the, uh, the lines themselves. Correct. What are these? Are these the lines that run through Lee's Hill South, Lee's Hill North? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they cross Mine Road there they too. They cross Mine Road. Go. A question that I have for our uh, it's Virginia Power or yes um, would be um, a few years ago they actually cut down some trees that sort of help hide a water <coughs> tower they would have in Mine Road. If they raise the towers, like they say, they're going to do probably up to 56 feet is the average you said. Will they? Will that also raise the height? Because I know that that the lines do swing down, and supposedly they vary up and down is what I've been told. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly. Will that also raise the amount of height they allow vegetation to grow um, before they go in there and cut it down? Because what's happened is. You know, even though they went in and put some vegetation, they really don't take very good care of it. They've just abandoned it, and now it's a bunch of weeds among some plants there. And I would like to know whether or not that extra footage would then allow me to go up, which might give me once they grow to the proper height. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I would defer that question to the representatives if that is okay. the board. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Les O'Donnell. I'm the project manager for the uh, project in question. And specifically to your, to your question, uh, this uh, structure height increase is pretty subtle. In fact, the entire 34 miles, it, it's only going up about four and a half feet on average. But when the height goes up, it actually allows danger trees a little bit more room, room to grow because uh, danger tree is not allowed to, if it were to fall from off of the right of way, it's not allowed to come within 15 feet of the conductor. So if the conductor goes up a little bit more, then that would mean that there are less danger trees to be uh, taken, taken care of. In this case, it's not, it's not significant because it's such a small, small increase. What, what is the height that you're allowed to grow a tree before? Because I've been it, told that your lines will, during seasons, and I'm not sure exactly what go with a high power voltage, what, that you can actually, they will be lowered and up and down. I mean, well, you, when, the lines carry, when the lines carry heavy current during the winter, or particularly in the summer when it's so hot, they will sag some, just like the distribution circuits do uh, on the streets. But that is factored into the, the danger tree calculation when they determine which ones. And we're required to remove any that would, would come within. So I guess the, the general premise I'm saying is if we go up slightly, that would give more latitude for uh, growth of trees and less apt to have to, to bother any of them. Okay. I'll have further, but I'll let you do your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Is that your presentation? I mean, well, I was just I was just answering your question. I I didn't. Uh, I'm willing to answer any others or. Well, no, but you. Does the applic do, do they have a presentation? There or? is no okay. presentation since this is county initiated. Okay. okay. Well, then I'm going to ask you. This probably isn't the, the really pertains to it. But as I've said earlier, when you cut our trees down before on Mine Road, where it crosses Mine Road at, mm -hmm. that would be on Lee's Hill North Side. Okay. Um, we ask you to go in there and at least put some type of vegetation in there. And your first, your first time you did it, you put some very nice vegetation that hopefully would help grow and uh, hide the behind our, our waste area there. We have a uh, trash area there, collection area there, and um, we have a water tower behind that. And unfortunately, and, you know, when you cut those trees down, it really opened everything up to see that. Okay. So we ask you to go in there and put a nice vegetation back that wouldn't affect your wires. But then after we did that, we had to have you come out one time and clean it. And since that time, and this has been quite a few years back, and I, I don't mind the amendment to it to help you out, but it's a, also an opportunity to me to ask you guys to if you could follow up and not only on a, a request by us or by myself, but a continuous plan that you have to go out there and sort of keep it to where those trees are allowed to grow to where it might might get to a height where it will cover that water tower. It's not a water tower standing up on, on stilts. It's a water tower that starts from the bottom, okay. big round cylinder. So well, that's I, something that w I would, you know, appreciate. I, I understand your, your uh, line of thinking, and I'll take that back. Uh, it sounds like it's the entrance to the mine road substation, perhaps. No, sir, that it's one is done well. Oh. I mean, we've had yeah. some people there uh, put some things in there and taking yeah. it on their own. But the side I'm talking about would be the south side of uh, Mine Road, which From. is you can't even tell you've got uh, that you even have your planted uh, vegetation there anymore. OK. OK. All right. Sure. So thank you very much. I appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? We'll open up public presentation time. Is anybody signed up to speak? No, sir. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this uh, public presentation or public hearing at this time? During the, uh, the towers and the redoing? We'll close the public hearing portion. Any other questions from the board? I'll make a motion to approve the amendment. Okay, any other discussion? We'll call the question. Six yes. Thank you. Next item is R16-0004, 
Catherine T. Neal and Rebecca T. Akers, uh, Thorburn Estates, and RO 16-0004 at Chancellor District. So um, for the board, I know I just got an email from Mr. McLaughlin. He was at a, a medical appointment. He's 45 minutes out. Would it be the board's pleasure to delay this because it is in the Chancellor District, or do we want to pr proceed forward, or can we delay it? If it's the board's pleasure, yes, you can certainly delay Any it. Comments? Till later in the meeting, yeah. Hey, Mr. Chair, I, my question would be, do we have people here that um, to, to speak if, if it's delayed, if it would inconvenience them other than that? I, no concern. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience that came here to speak on this that would uh, mind if we delayed 45 minutes? If, if Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then, with that. I'll stand down from public hearings. I go board reports, Mr. Chairman, or no. presentations? Can go board reports and then go into presentations, as I said. So I see Mr. Skinner left, so I won't start with him. Mr. Yakubowski, do you have any board reports? Uh, two real quick. One, um, I had asked a while ago from staff. I know we're in the middle of budget at the time. But just a gentle reminder about information of the 287G program uh, dealing with the federal government and the localities and illegal aliens um, at the uh, earliest um, board meeting that we have, if we can have information on, on what, um, if anything, we can do, uh, if it might even need to be regional. Uh, and then the other um, ask that I have is of staff to, I think that we've had this before as a presentation, but to the board, and it was with the EDT committee, and since that committee is no more, it kind of has uh, hung out there, is the Route 1 revitalization um, idea that we had had. And I would ask that perhaps staff can um, come up with some uh, information and present it to the board in a couple of months of steps that we can take to um, take the ideas that we had had and put them into some sort of a, a guiding document so that we can move ahead uh, when it comes to, um, uh, let's say, uh, transportation improvements along Route 1 in that corridor, if there's money that comes up for smart scale, let's say, uh, that we already have projects identified and things like that so that we are ready to go uh, when, when monies <coughs> become available because, of course, we have no money right now to do anything. Uh, or if there's other... Um, uh, private sector folks who want to look at revitalizing it, at least they know what the county is looking for, and it's less of a guessing game on their part, and uh, sort of puts us, um, you know, in, in the front of the issue. Thank you. Mr. Sabula? No report. Mr. Batten? I just wanted to let the public know that uh, the Belmont Club of Women and the Belmont Ruritan Club, located on Belmont Road, right next to Fire Rescue Station, Spotsylvania Fire Rescue Station 9, is now uh, has uh, internet availability to the public on Mondays from 4 to 7, if I'm correct on that. Um, and just wanted to give a big thank you to the uh, Belmont Club of Women and the Belmont Ruritan Club for allowing this. Um, and again, you have the library there, and they'll have their full complement of uh, services that they normally render available to the public there, and I hope it's uh, taken advantage of. <coughs> also, Haley's Mill Road is now officially paved. Uh, same with Williams uh, Lane is now officially paved. Mm. Um, they'll be doing a, a, a third resurfacing later on towards the fall, but uh, two more paved roads in, in Livingston District. Dr. Trampy. No report. And the chair has no report. We go into the Spotsylvania <coughs> Business Appreciation Week presentation. Yes, we should have a brief report from economic development. And here are Sophia and Courtney now. Good evening, ladies.
I have the floor, computer, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. We're here to update you on an upcoming economic development tourism activity regarding Business Appreciation Week. The Economic Development and Tourism Department will be hosting Business Appreciation Week, a week-long series of events designed to benefit and recognize our local businesses beginning on May 1st and ending on May 5th. This coincides with the Small Business Administration's National Business Week taking place that same week in Virginia's Business Appreciation Month. The goals are to build relationships with local business owners, form partnerships with existing regional organizations, and show appreciation to our existing businesses. We will be kicking off our week with a mini business walk on Monday, May 1st. At this event, we will have staff members from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism visiting a number of local businesses in an effort to gather feedback on the business climate and to show appreciation to them for being a part of the Spotsylvania business community. The following day, we'll be partnering with the Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Office to host a seminar on business safety, <clears throat> providing business owners with tips on how to protect their companies from fraud, theft, and other crimes. On Wednesday, we'll be hosting a, a women-owned business seminar in partnership with the Virginia Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity. We will have a representative from that state agency there to guide attendees through registering with, to sell to the state through the EVA system. We also have local business owner, Ginny Mastin of Matron Staffing there to speak about her personal experiences as a Spotsylvania business owner. On Thursday, May 4th, we'll be hosting our largest event of the week. From small home-based businesses to our largest employers, each business helps to make our county unique. In appreciation to all of Spotsylvania County businesses who choose us as their home, the county will be hosting a business appreciation breakfast at Stevenson Ridge from 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. We will be wrapping up the week with an open house on Friday, May 5th. This will be held in the lobby of the Merchant Square building. We will have um, a number of representatives from county departments and local region, regional agencies there to answer business-related questions for attendees. At this time, we would like to request that the chairman and members of the board approve this proclamation declaring May 1st through May 5th as Spotsylvania's Business Appreciation Week. Does the board have any questions? I heard a motion to approve by Mr. Sabula. Any other discussion? All right, we'll call the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent job, ladies. Thank you. Six yes. Mr. Chair. Uh, if it would be without exception uh, from the other members, I know that uh, Mr. McLaughlin and I have worked a lot on the uh, animal shelter expansion, and if all possible, could we allow maybe the Frim to go first until he arrives, if there's no objection to anybody? No objection. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Frim. You move up in the batting order. I can have control of the computer, please. Good evening, Chairman Ross, board members. Uh, my name is Matthew Embry. I'm the Division Chief of Emergency Management and Logistics for the Department of Fire Rescue and Emergency Management, uh, and also serve as the Emergency Management Coordinator for the county. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to give a brief overview of our emergency operations plan and recommendation for renewal uh, and adoption by this board. The emergency operations plan is a legal and uh, provides a legal and organizational basis uh, for emergency operations in Spotsylvania County. Uh, this is designed for all types of disasters being large or small scale. Uh, it assigns responsibilities uh, broad and or specific for county departments and agencies as well as disaster mitigation, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. So that's what an operations, emergency operations plan is. The maintenance requirements are what bring us here tonight. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia Emergency Services and Disaster Law of 2000 require that each locality or interjurisdictional agency prepare and keep a local or interjurisdictional emergency operation plan for its area. Uh, this plan is required to be updated every four years, and we are at that time for update. 
the notification to the public also within the Commonwealth of Virginia Emergency Services and Disaster Law of 2000, it requires that any locality that has residents over the number of 50,000 is required to provide public notification. Spotsylvania County, through our emergency operations plan and through other uh, agencies, utilize our Spotsy Alert system to make notification to our citizens, our reverse 911 system, which is for Verizon home phones, media outlets through our public notification and PIO releases, we include radio and TV in those. Additionally, with regards to North Anna Power Plant, we have the sirens that are provided by Dominion. Uh, we also can use the emergency alert system through the uh, Virginia Department of Emergency Management. We can use NOAA weather alert systems, which we have actually patched through our uh, Spotsy alert system. And we can use ham radio operators if everything else fails. Uh, we can use them to talk to uh, other localities or other locations. So. Uh, the confidentiality part, which is why this is brief. Um, the public disclosure of this document would have a reasonable likelihood to threaten public safety by exposing critical operations, operational plans, processes, and procedures, critical infrastructure, communications, and vulnerabilities subject to terrorist activities. So we request that this remain as a confidential document. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Um, I believe we need a motion to approve this for another year. Is that right? I believe it's going into closed session. Is that correct, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, there is a there is a component of the plan that is, as Carl will advise us, exempt from public disclosure that needs to be covered in uh, closed session prior to action okay. on the whole plan by the board. I would recommend. <clears throat> Very good. All right, thank you. Are you fine? I, if I just go ahead. Make a motion since Mr. McLaughlin, we know he's about four, now 40 to three minutes out. How we, would it be okay to go into closed session at this time? Okay. I'd make a motion to go into closed session. Uh, prior to that, and when we come out of it, we'll know we can do the uh, um, business for the uh, firm as as far as that, and then hopefully um, Mr. Okay. McLaughlin would be here. Sounds good. Carl, you want to read us in the closed door? Yes, yeah, so uh, this will be your resolution to adjourn in the closed meeting. Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of a public body, specifically a chief of fire, rescue, and emergency management. And whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for discussion or consideration, the acquisition of real property for a public purpose or the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body, specifically discussion of real property in the Lees, Hills, Lees Hill District. And whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry, where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community, specifically a systems engineering and technical assistance business, the manufacture of food product, products business, a storage business, and a manufacturer of real recreational products business. Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for a consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel, specifically uh, regarding changes to the county code, and whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desired to, desires to adjourn in a closed meeting for discussion of plans to protect public safety as it relates to terrorist activity or specific cybersecurity threats or vulnerabilities, and briefings by staff members, legal counsel, and law enforcement or emergency service emergency service officials concerning actions taken to respond to such matters or a related threat to public safety, discussion of rec records excluded from this chapter pursuant to subdivisions three or four of section 2.23705.2, where discussions in an open meeting would jeopardize the safety of any person or the security of any facility, building structure, information technology system, or software program, or discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any government facility, building, or structure, or the safety of persons using such facility, building, or structure, specifically the county's emergency operations plans. 
whereas pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711-A1, 3, 5, 7, and 19, such discussions may occur in closed meeting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors does hereby authorize discussion of the aforestated stated matters. So moved. Call the question. open meeting resolution. Whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia <coughs> law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors hereby returns to open meeting and certifies by roll call vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion to convene in the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting. Okay. Mr. Skinner. Aye. Dr. Trampy. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Mr. McLaughlin. Aye. Mr. Sabula. Aye. Mr. Yakubowski. Aye. And the chair, aye. You want to? All right, coming out of a uh, closed meeting, first um, I, we have a uh, um, need to move to approve the emergency operations plan that has been updated. So move. So move. Call the question. Seven yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you to do, please. Next, next, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, is a, uh, uh, the economic development matters that were identified as placeholder on the agenda. One is uh, your approval, please, on a performance agreement uh, with the RPI group. Uh, this is an incentive agreement for the uh, retention of a business and creation of new jobs and investment in our community and they will be in the deep run office park. Ask for your approval of uh, uh, authorization to execute the performance agreement in a form substantially similar to that presented to you in closed session. So moved. Okay, call the question. Seven yes. Mr. Chairman, back in, board members, back in uh, February of this year, the governor announced um, IDX Corporation um, coming to uh, Spotsylvania County. And the governor's announcement detailed um, a <coughs> commitment of $400,000 grant from the Commonwealth Opportunity Fund. And there were other particulars uh, related to that that have already been the subject of uh, press releases and, and uh, public appreciation, but the, the key piece for us has been the requirement of a local match uh, to go along with the $400,000 from the state. And so we have completed and have um, for your approval the uh, local performance agreement, um, well, actually both pieces. There is a necessity, uh, Carl, can these be done in one motion or two motions? I'll go ahead and do the first motion for the uh, Commonwealth Development Opportunity Fund Spotsylvania Local Grant Performance Agreement. And this is authorizing execution of the Commonwealth's agreement uh, on behalf of the county. Gentlemen. Authorize uh, me to do that, please, Mr. Hey, Chairman. If you have a motion from Mr. Jakubowski, call the question. Seven yes. And then attendant to that to provide the $400,000 um, local match and other incentives um, is the uh, local uh, performance agreement that is the companion and we need a separate motion for authorization and execution of that agreement and, and, as well. And that will also include authorization to uh, execute the attendant purchase and sale agreement. Um, and this is to uh, provide uh, the local incentives above and beyond that 400,000 match, uh, which comes to $1.125 uh, million. Uh, they have to meet the same goals, including uh, the, the jobs requirement up to, uh, they have to get up to 150 uh, 
new jobs, um, and they have to also have to make uh, the attendant, um, I believe it's over $7 million in capital investment. Um, and the purchase and sale agreement uh, provides for um, the acquisition of uh, the back uh, portion of that property uh, pursuant to the certain terms and conditions uh, stated therein. Mr. Chair, if I could, I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve, but along the same lines, I, I want to say that there's been many years that we've been trying to work with the GMC plant, and there's a lot of effort by many people, uh, not only this board, but uh, our, our people here and outside the Frederick Re Regional Alliance has been very helpful in this. So um, although it's taken some time, I think we've got a very good deal that we are accepting tonight. And uh, I just want to say thanks for everybody that's been involved with it. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, just to, to clarify, too, um, the authority will be to authorize Mark to execute these agreements, and it will be in a uh, uh, form substantially uh, as the same that has been presented to you. Uh, we have to take care of just a, a couple of uh, dates that were put in on the agreement that need to be put in with the last signature and um, very minor things like that. And one fact correction. the. Total um, local incentive is $1,525,000. Um, that is a, a combination of a infrastructure grant of uh, half million dollars for roof repairs, $400,000 toward the, uh, that, that covers the match with the Commonwealth Opportunity Fund, um, and other uh, grants to cover uh, permit costs and to rebate personal property, uh, machinery tools, and furniture and fixtures tax. This is all well within uh, guidelines and, and parameters as established by uh, economic development um, agreements that the board has entered into in the past two years. It's consistent with our county practices and economically positive for the citizens. Yes, that would be great. But I, I would like to mention one other thing then, too, that people understand, even though we're given in Sims, there is a, a, a good thing for this county because we're receiving some of that property for uh, possibly other industrial sites or uh, other industries to come in and do that. So uh, it's not one piece. We've got a little piece of that pie there. And so we've made out very well, opened the opportunities for other businesses to work in that area, too. Thank you. I have a motion for Mr. Skinner. Any other discussion? Call the question. Seven yes. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, board members, that concludes matters out of closed session. And um, I think that given the advertisement of the public hearing, is the board's pleasure to go back to the Public hearing on R16-0004, Catherine T. Neal and Rebecca Akers, that's Thorburn Estates in the Chancellor District, R016-0004. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Floor computer, please. This is a request to amend the proffers approved with the rezoning case approved in 2014 for Thorburn Estates, which rezoned approximately 170 acres from rural to residential two to create a 59 lot subdivision. The proposed amendment is to extend the deadline to either construct the proffered transportation improvements or pay the county a lump sum totaling $971,664 to the prior to the 30th um, occupancy permit. Here is the aerial map to help uh, reorient you with this project. The uh, star, of course, is highlighting this project area. The property lies on the south side of Chancellor Road, approximately a half mile west of Gordon Road and half a mile east of Old, um, Old Plank Road. Here is the approved layout of Thorburn Estates. As mentioned, it's a 15, 59 single family detached lot subdivision ranging in size from two to four acre lots. Uh, the development will be accessed from Chancellor Road. The roads within the development will be public and each lot will be uh, served with individual septic mm -hmm. systems and well. The approved transportation proffer provided for two options. 
The first being that the applicant would construct off-site improvements at the Chancellor Road and Old Plank Road intersection, which included widening Chancellor Road to add a northbound turning lane on Chancellor Road onto Plank, Old Plank Road, and construct a dedicated westbound left turn lane from Old Plank Road onto Chancellor Road. The second option provided that the applicant would pay a lump sum to the county in the amount of $971,664, which is the estimated cost of the improvements within a year of preliminary plat approval. Uh, the preliminary plat was approved in July of 2016, so that date is, is upon us here this, this July. A few key points for consideration. The northbound approach on Chancellor Road currently operates at a level of service E. The impact of the Thorburn Estates development would degrade that level of service to an F. The proffered road improvements uh, will elevate the level of service for the intersection to a D, so the timing of these improvements are very important. The community's support with the original rezoning hinged on the applicant's commitment to complete the improvements to the intersection prior to the additional Thorburn Estates traffic. It's an existing problem, and um, so the community became supportive early in the process, knowing that these improvements will be made um, early in the process. To date, other than preliminary plat approval, the applicant has taken no actions towards complying with the conditions related to the transportation improvements, which included steps of having a scoping meeting with VDOT, preparing construction plans, um, doing their due diligence to see if the right-of-way could be acquired, relocating the utilities and such. The rezoning was approved with the expectation that the improvements would be completed early in the process, as I noted. The applicant's proposal does not meet, does not provide an expected timeline for the completion. And at this, with a 30th, prior to the 30th occupancy permit, there's just no way to, to determine how fast or how slow that build out would be. So we don't have any uh, guarantee of a uh, completion date. As I mentioned, we, um, the Planning Commission uh, did have a public hearing in January. They um, recommended approval of the proffers as proposed, uh, and staff is recommending the, the board deny the request as it uh, falls short of what was approved with the original rezoning. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the board? Okay. I think the applicant has 10 minutes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors, good evening. I'm Clark Lemming. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, as uh, Kimberly indicated, this was rezoned in 2014 uh, with certain uh, proffers. Uh, some of the proffers have uh, uh, become moot. Uh, for instance, there was a proffer that if the county had requested, so within 90 days of the approval of the preliminary plan, the payment would be made instead of the road improvement. Well, that, that train is, has come and gone, and the request was not made. Um, the, you may recall that uh, daughters of the original owner of the property now own the property and have sought this rezoning. After 2014, they met with about uh, two dozen different builders and developers uh, seeking a purchaser of the property. Now, in retrospect, maybe they should have done that before they sought the rezoning. They weren't able to enter into a contract with anyone because of the, that possibility of that upfront payment, uh, because it was a sub sub substantial sum uh, and because it depleted the ability to borrow money for construction. So um, the preliminary plan came and went. The 90 days came and went. Uh, the, the sisters have located a, a builder and have entered into a contract with the builder. Uh, Chris Stacy, who's uh, here at my left here, with Stacy Build Homes, uh, and the proffer amendment originally geared uh, in an effort to try to rescue the sisters from a payment they thought they were going to have to make that they couldn't afford, uh, and they couldn't find a, a builder to move forward. Uh, that has uh, transitioned, I think, 
to simply an effort on the part of Mr. Stacy, the contract purchaser, uh, for clarity in the proffer uh, and the timing of the payment. Now, you'll be pleased to know, and I, uh, it may be our fault because we didn't bring her up to date, there have been meetings with VDOTs, uh, with VDOT, uh, and indeed, uh, there have been substantial efforts to obtain the right-of-way. Uh, until we know what's going to happen with the proffer amendment, there have been no payments. Uh, but engineering work has been done on the right-of-way. We know exactly how much right-of-way is needed from each respective owner. Uh, so that is underway. Now, the only thing that triggers the payment to the county at this point under the original proffers, the only thing that triggers the payment is a halt to that process. If it becomes clear that we cannot obtain the right-of-way that's, that's needed, and there are several options for the right-of-way, uh, or if we can't move utilities. Now, another, neither of those things has arisen to this point. So we were optimistic at this point that the improvement is going to be made. Now, that brings us to the, the present uh, proffer amendment. The proffer amendment that came through the Planning Commission simply seeks to move the payment to a midpoint uh, of the development. Um, that midpoint provides uh, some degree of protection uh, for the contract purchaser. Uh, of course, if the improvement proceeds uh, as is presently contemplated, then, then that's all irrelevant as well. Now, we have, that, so that's why we, that's why we are where we stand the way we do tonight, with the proffer amendment that was recommended for approval uh, by your planning commission. Uh, now, staff uh, takes a different position and says, well, you're better off under the original proffer. Well, the truth of the matter is we may be better off, too, because there's no time frame for completion of the improvements. And as long as the uh, builder is moving forward in good faith and can acquire the right of way, you know, it happens when it happens. So both parties would probably benefit from some clarity on when things need to happen, which are not contained under the original proffers. Now, we're here tonight uh, uh, with, a, with an open mind if there is another configuration uh, that the board would uh, like us to consider. Uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, we can live with the proffers that were recommended for approval from the Planning Commission. Uh, it, it's becoming clearer and clearer that probably the builder can live with the existing proffers. Uh, but uh, if there are other things that you would like for us to consider, uh, we're pleased to do so. Uh, so I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that at least for openers, unless there are, are questions or things you would like us to, to consider, I think that concludes my basic presentation. Are there any questions of the applicant? Yeah, Mr. Chair. But, Did you have some suggestions on how you might come up with a solution? Well, uh, yes, I did. And to address the, the issue of the timing uh, of the payment, so that there is some greater degree of certainty. Uh, what I have suggested is a provision that would appear at Proffer 2F2. Uh, this is the one titled alternate cash payment. And what this says at this point is simply in the event the applicant is unable to acquire right of way and authorization to relocate utilities, the applicant pays the money uh, to the county. Uh, no later than the issuance of the occupancy permit for the 30th unit. What I've added to that uh, is um, no later than the issuance of the occupancy permit for the 30th unit or the lapse of two years from the date of the adoption of this proffer amendment, whichever comes first. So there's certainty. Uh, and the payment comes uh, either at that 30th unit or uh, at, the, um, uh, at the expiration of two years. Um, there was some concern, so a question, I think uh, Ms. Carter asked at the Planning Commission, well, what happens if the builder gets to the 30th unit and doesn't go any further? Uh, the, the, the payment is not, uh, or 29th unit doesn't go further, the payment's not triggered. This, this I think, resolves that. Um, uh, there, has, there also was some uh, discussion uh, about uh, interest if the payment is made at a later point in time, uh, and we're happy to address that also. And uh, Mr. McLaughlin, I have some uh, language that I can propose to you uh, to address that issue if you'd like me to do so. Okay, what I've indicated is that 
uh, such payment, we're talking about the payment, if made, if and when made, shall be subject to interest at the rate of 4% annually uh, from the date of the adoption of this proffer amendment until payment is made. Uh, so that would, uh, the if, if, if indeed the payment would have been made sooner under the current professors. And please remember that that's not at all certain because of the improvement is made. There's no payment to talk about. But in the event the payment is made uh, and comes somewhat later than it would have under the original proffers, uh, then you have the interest to cover that. So that those would be uh, ways, I think, that we could address comments that came up at the, at the Planning Commission and based on some of our discussions recently regarding the certainty of payment. So, Mr. Chair, a couple more quick ones. And, and again, I, I think uh, from the residents that had, the, the desire was to get the intersection improved, and that's still the goal. It's either or, the proper cash payment or improve the, the intersection of Chancellor and Old Plank to the VDOT standard, which yes, is sir. the goal of everybody. And the sooner, I think, uh, is better, and that's really a goal here, is to get the project done, the road work done sooner. <coughs> there was also some concerns in the past from some other residents, uh, trail connection to um, Cloverdale. There, I know there was concern there that some residents had upset with that, as well as the uh, on Thornburg Farm Lane, just the ability for tree obscuring, and people had comment about, you know, having these subdivisions up and obscuring their view and things like that. So has there been anything that you've considered for something like that? Well, with regard to the, uh, uh, the trail, there are two portions of the trail on the property, one shown along Chancellor Road that is uh, something that is required under the county's comprehensive plan, but there's a southern par portion of the trail that I think you're talking about that goes over to Cloverdale. And uh, we don't, we're, we're uh, happy not to build that trail. That's simply an additional cost uh, to the builder. Uh, so we have no uh, problem with that except the, the procedural problem. And I don't know where that, where all this stands at this point. Uh, we're happy to uh, eliminate the uh, southern portion of the trail by proffer. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, we really don't have any use uh, for that property. Uh, there have been some uh, what would be technically considered encroachments on that area now by some of the residents that have lived there. and. I think some of them, one of whom is with us this evening, uh, assumed it was an easement rather than property owned in fee simple by the Acres uh, sisters. So happy, uh, more than happy to uh, to work with you uh, on that. Now on your the, the tree, what, 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 I'm, that was was that a separate issue that you were raising? Yeah, th there was a there were some concerns about along the uh, the road then Thornburg Farm Lane. Some of the residents had talked about in the past. I remember them talking about there are going to be homes there now, vice the fields. Was there anything that was ever considered on that? Uh, it, uh, not specifically, but I don't think that the contract purchaser, you've done, you, you did that? Say that again? We gave them right away. Oh. All right, come up here so you can be sure, let's be sure we're being responsive to Mr. McLaughlin. This is young Mr. Akers, grandson of the original owner, right? Great grandson. Great grandson, okay. Yep. Time passes. Um, I know we had met with uh, one of the owners on Thorburn uh, Road, and we had given him, uh, I believe it was 10-foot easement to plant trees so he would have his property protected. Okay, so you're not proffering to plant a row of trees at all? No, we'd give him in the right-of-way. We had met th with him prior to going through the original. Um, this was something that you raised when we came through originally, wasn't it? And after the rezoning they went and actually deeded that land, G gave him the ability to plant those trees on that property. Okay, but you're not actually correct. planting the trees. They, they no, weren't going no, to offer that. No, he was satisfied with having the ability to pick his trees out and plant them. But unless, you, unless you know otherwise, we think that that was uh, addressed after the last uh, rezoning. Uh, so uh, happy to do those things. Uh, let me add this. The builder uh, has been under contract now for about what, three months. Uh, and is, is uh, most anxious, uh, this is the building season, is most anxious to proceed. So, uh, however we work through these issues, uh, the timing of all of this is critical to both the uh, owners of the property and to the contract owner at this point. I believe that the um, proposal that I gave you on the uh, payment uh, hopefully would just be considered a clarification of that proper. It's certainly less restrictive because the county could end up with more money because of the interest there. 
uh, with regard to the uh, easement, uh, one of two things. If we can figure out how to uh, move the process along, we're happy to uh, make that change. Uh, if, if, if this involves a, a delay uh, because of uh, other bodies that need to rehear this matter, uh, we can, if, if we, th th they'll have to decide what they want to do about that. But uh, I will give you this assurance from both the owner and the uh, contract purchaser that if we can proceed with the development, that as soon as settlement occurs, the contract purchaser will come back to the board and remove uh, the trail. And that would be a clean proffer amendment with nothing else associated with it. And we'd all know where we were going right from the first. So I present those options for your consideration. Happy to uh, cooperate and make those changes. Would like to move forward. Mr. Benton. Well, I commend you, number one, for coming and not wanting to either reduce or do away with the proffers. Um, I don't have an issue with them being delayed a period of time as long as we get them. <clears throat> what a, what's the, so I can educate myself a yes, little sir. bit maybe, what happens if uh, we get the two years or whatever the case is and the proffer still can't be paid? and the 30th has been, occupancy has been given, what happens then? Well, you may be better off talking with your, your attorney about your recourse there, but remember you would have had a builder in there who's built 30 houses at that point. Uh, so there would be a variety of remedies, I think, that would uh, present themselves to the county if indeed payment was not made. I think that the possibility of that is fairly slim for this reason. Uh, if, if he gets to 30 units, you've got a, a su pretty successful development. The likelihood that it's not going to build out all the way is, is, is pretty slim, I think. Okay. So I, I, I don't think that would materialize, but if it did, I'm sure as your attorney can tell you, there is recourse that the, family, that the, the county would have. Uh, there's value in the property. Uh, there may be even more value in the lots uh, that are on the property. Is, and for this development, because I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know of it, is there sidewalks for this development? With internally, uh, we do not know. This is, this is open. Uh, they're not internal sidewalks. The ordinance for this kind of development, because it's fairly, uh, fairly big lots, does not require sidewalk. Okay. And also, my last question, isn't it, Ms. Palmano, this may be for you. Wouldn't it be normal procedure for this to go back to planning to... It depends. Um, and uh, I suggested <laughs> or discussed with Ms. Reglion, because we've you know, considered several different changes, um, not knowing exactly what uh, Mr. Lemming would come with uh, tonight. Um, so once we have those, he's mentioned a couple of things. Uh, my recommendation would be to take a, a brief recess um, after the public hearing to determine what are the necessary steps based on what he has offered here as far as changes to the proffers and also certify and clarify what exactly those, those changes are that he is offering. Um, so I think once I evaluate those, I'll be able to advise the board as to procedurally what are the next steps. Don't, now this is, so we're not changing things for one development compared to another? No, no. It, our our um, evaluation is, is consistent. Um, it's not, you know, favoring one versus the other. It's straight interpretation of the procedures required under the code. Okay. And I just, you know, again, I like... I appreciate you coming and not wanting to do away with these. Sure. And if the board were recall, we just gave away at least four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and we're taking a low ball four hundred thousand dollars for the right in right out at Riverbend. So we gave away basically eight hundred thousand dollars of revenue for yes, a right in right out at Riverbend from a developer. So mainly trying to make this work. Are there any other questions from the board? Mr. Skinner. This is for us, Carl. On uh, what you've said is that you now want to take what uh, Mr. Lemon has uh, offered in the changes and you're going to review it and then we'll come back and later decide whether or not you go because, you know, I, I do have to say <clears throat> we've made proffers before that have not gone to the Planning Commission. So uh, to me, this would be somewhat really drastic points I mean it was pretty understandable what he said out there so and, and this is your interpretation coming back to this board so 
I, I just want to know, will you be doing that while we may be proceeding on with, uh, or do you need the board in a closed session to go over? No, it? not at all. I was just um, recommending a recess, a brief recess where I could meet with the applicant um, and just go over and certify exactly what he is offering um, to be able to evaluate and provide advice to the board. So it would be a recess where I can meet with the applicant briefly. Yeah, I, think, I think we can get that done, you know, w within a pretty short order this evening. I have the language written out. I think we have the original uh, proffers. And that's exactly right. I need to look at that and be able to determine. The reason I'm asking <coughs> is that uh, <coughs> a recess, but yeah, we have other business tonight. Could that be done while other business is being given? I mean, are you talking five minutes? Are you talking 10 minutes? Because, you know. I, I think I could do it in 10 minutes, and I would obviously, you know, depending on the business that the board is continuing to undertake, it, it may be necessary that or recommended that I be here and be available to that rather than, you know, be somewhere else. So I, I think we could do it in about 10 minutes. Right. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, we'll now open the public hearing. Amy, has anybody signed up to speak? Yes, sir. Rick Lanham. Yes, I'm Rick Lanham. I live on Cloverdale Street, and I'm just addressing you guys in regards to the walking trail. In 2014, I was here to discuss the removal of the walking trail. In early 2015, I presented a petition of 98% of the people on Cloverdale Street that did not want the walking trail. Um, the other 2% wasn't at home at the time. Since then, I've talked to those. We're at 100%. Um, we have a few issues and concerns of the walking trail coming out onto our street, which is, it's not a two-lane road, there's no lines, it's just coming out to the middle of nowhere. And a discussion with the, the new purchaser, he agrees that, you know, it should be removed and we just request that you consider that. Thank you. Anybody else signed up to speak? No, sir. Is there anybody else out, out here tonight that uh, did not sign up to speak that would like to speak at this time? Okay, and I understand we should not close the public hearing. Is that correct, Carl? Yeah, again, I would uh, think a recess would be in order to allow us to determine, allow me to determine how to best advise you, you know, procedurally what can, what y'all can do going forward, if that's okay with the board. Okay, without objection, we'll do a five-minute recess. So I believe Carl, our county attorney, has reviewed the changes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, I think the uh, the applicant is um, now going to, to recite the the changes to the proffers um, that he's he's making here today. Um, the as I understand it, one of those at least will be material, so that will require that the public hearing be kept open um, and allow uh, for uh, re-advertisement um, of those material changes. So that'll be coming uh, at the second meeting in May. Right. So at this time, go ahead, Mr. Lemming. Thank you. Yes, sir, and thank, uh, uh, also thank the staff for working with us on this. So what we have uh, come up with, I, I have read to you the change that we would make to proffer 2F2, uh, and that concerns the uh, either or 30th unit or uh, the lapse of two years, whichever comes first, uh, and the interest uh, payment. And we will uh, present those proffers to your staff uh, and to the, uh, and, and they'll get to the county attorney's office for review prior to your, I think it's your May 16th meeting, that's your second uh, uh, meeting in May. Um, we, we could have handled this particular uh, proffer, I think, more expeditiously and come back to you at your next meeting. The material change uh, that necessitates the additional public hearing is the deletion of the southern portion of the trail. But uh, the owner, the contract purchaser, the supervisor, all want that deleted. So the, the only way to do that in the confines of this application is to have another, is to continue your public hearing and come back to see you on the 16th of May. Uh, so that's what we will do. I and believe it's the 23rd. That's correct. Is correct. it 23rd? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right, you're second and fourth. Sp Stafford is first and third, okay. Um, uh, so we'll be back on that date to take care of that. 
Okay? Okay. All so, right. Thank Ms. you all. Thank you all for working with us and for your patience this evening. Carl. Pardon me. I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, the motion would be to uh, keep the public hearing open to re-advertise the, uh, the new changes to the proffers. Okay. Motion to keep the public hearing open and re-advertise the proffers in the second week in May. Second meeting in May. Right. Continue it to the second meeting in May. Continue to. Any discussion? Call the question. Seven yes. Brings us to the animal shelter. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, we're here this evening uh, to get uh, final direction from the board, please, uh, on the animal shelter project. Uh, just to give you a, a recap of uh, where we've uh, been and uh, where we are with the animal shelter project. Uh, going back to uh, November of 2013, uh, in a uh, spa uh, space need study, uh, that was conducted by the sheriff's office. Uh, there was uh, a proposed uh, addition to the animal shelter uh, of 11,000 square feet to meet the 20-year uh, 20 20 need. In April of 2014, the board authorized uh, the project moving forward uh, with a no-kill shelter, uh, and at that time, uh, the board asked to look at the option of a uh, new uh, replacement uh, of a shelter in another location uh, as well as look at uh, expansion of the existing facility. In uh, November of 2014, uh, the um, bond referendum for public safety included $3.79 million uh, for the animal shelter project, which was voted and approved uh, by the voters. Um, in the spring of 2015, um, staff uh, looked at the project again uh, for the budget uh, and found that uh, at the time uh, that the numbers were put in the bond referendum that it didn't include money for land, uh, land acquisition, site work, utilities. Uh, it only included construction of the building. Uh, at that time, we moved to May of 15 uh, and looked uh, at putting together stakeholders groups uh, to relook at the space needs. Uh, at that time, we also looked at several county-owned properties uh, that we had uh, to see whether or not uh, we could support uh, another animal shelter um, uh, in lieu of expansion of the existing project. Then with the uh, 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 CIP discussion, uh, in adoption in March and April of 2016, uh, the funding for the uh, project remained at the current level. Uh, the current level of the project now is at 3.72 million um, with no additional request uh, for the stakeholders to increase the project scope and budget. Uh, after that, uh, we came back with a, uh, uh, a couple of um, options for floor plans uh, that included an 8,000 square foot uh, addition uh, to the animal shelter, and then finally in October of uh, 2016, uh, the board approved a task order for an 8,000 square foot addition for us to move forward with design. After that meeting in October of 2016, there were still several questions by the board uh, as to how we got here and going back to the 2013 space needs study of 11,000 square feet, we were asked to look again at what an 11,000 square foot addition would cost. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Loveday uh, and let him take it from there, and we can look at the numbers and the uh, floor plans for the 
8,000 and the 11,000 square foot additions. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, basically, we were look, uh, asked to take a look at an 11,000 square foot addition, and I'll just go through a summary of the uh, current uh, project. Basically, we have $3.72 million available. That's what's currently in the uh, county funds to uh, fund this project. Uh, with an idea of doing a renovation of the existing 8,765 square foot facility, which will include overall updating the animal holding, uh, replacing the floor system, which has failed. That's, a, that's actually a mandated requirement. Uh, looking at the new kennel systems, uh, addition of dedicated intake carriers for the animals once they are delivered uh, through the sally port at the facility. Once again, that is a mandated state regulation uh, that we have to meet. And then rework of the administration and clinic space. Now, uh, like I said, we were asked to take a look at an additional 11,000 square foot option uh, that basically will look at supporting adoption activities and expand animal housing and will also include additional administrative support space. Here is a uh, rough estimate of what that 11,000 square foot facility would look like. Uh, we have a large number of uh, canine housings uh, that's uh, added to the facility over the 8,000 square foot expansion additional real-life rooms, visitation spaces, uh, larger dedicated uh, puppy areas, public restrooms, which was not included in the 8,000 square foot facility, and then also additional administrative space. Based on uh, what we've seen uh, at other localities, the expansion construction estimate stands at this for the 11,000 square foot option. It's about $2.6 million to actually construct the 11,000 square foot option with about $1.1 million in renovation going to the existing facility. Site work should be rather minimal if we uh, maintain the existing site due to parking, it's about, about a half million dollars. The uh, project design and construction is about $0.43 million. That brings the estimated total cost of an 11,000 square foot option with renovation to $4.72 million. That's an estimated budget shortfall of $1 million based on what current funding levels are at. And with that, let's stand ready to answer any questions you may have uh, regarding the 11,000 square foot option. Dr. Trampy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, how far out do we expect the 8,000 foot option and the 11,000 foot option to meet the county needs? How many years? With this option that um, is before you tonight, we're estimating uh, uh, 10 to most definitely 20, right in there. You can't guarantee 20, but I feel very confident that this would meet <clears throat> 20 years, which we were shooting for. Uh, the 8,000, when we came back uh, <clears throat> uh, before you a few months ago with that option, we weren't too sure. Uh, we're 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 pretty sure that this will will meet the ten to twenty years which we were shooting for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. hey, a couple of questions here. So the space needs study said we need eleven thousand to get us to the ten to twenty year mark. Is that? Yes, sir. Um, so a couple. You know, I know that we we work with the city too. Do they have to contribute at all towards the? The city pays us a considerable amount of. Each year, I think the board members agreed to what the cost was going to be. So we have a um, contract or a uh, MOU with the city, and each year I believe we increase the price. Ten percent? Yes, sir. It's uh, it's twenty five thousand dollars was the original contract, and it goes up ten percent. But there is room for negotiations once this project is complete. Okay, so I, I guess I was getting, there's no requirement of them to contribute towards the construction? No, sir. But no, we'll, just, we'll just get that as part of the annual yes, sir. maintenance yes, fee and, right. and the cost associated with it. And uh, so when this project kicked off several years ago, I think the original estimate was in the 13 or $14 million range, wasn't it? It was pretty significant. I'm not sure how we ever got to that. I think somewhere the Taj Mahal yeah. was mentioned, but that's right. never what we were looking for. We so, were looking for basic no-kill. Right. And I. I Again, I'm a supporter of the bigger, you know, the 11,000 square foot facility because as long as we're building it now, let's build it based on the requirements and based on the experts' opinion of what we need. Um, the Jackson Village proffer last year put a million dollars specifically for animal shelter. So there's our million dollar surplus or shortfall with what was estimated in the uh, bond referendum plus the million dollar proffer. That covers our shortfall. 
And I think here's an opportunity now where the funds have lined up that we should move forward with this project and, uh, you know, I say get right with the animals because right now we're not. We, we brought an update of the proffer where they're at uh, to, for the board. So, for the, uh, so pending this, basically this week, I uh, pulled together this funding breakout slide, which most of the stuff can go over the uh, overall project budget, how we get to 3.72, but specific reference to Jackson Village. Uh, they have already received a site plan approval of 245 units, which is a value of 295225 and they have uh, 450 units under review right now uh, at 524250 for the associated proffer. That brings your total proffer value right now as of today, you know, to eight. $820,000. Uh, the key is here that right now uh, that proffer is due upon occupancy permits so that you know, we'll be getting that over a period of time unless a, another agreement is found. I, I was under impression we had a million dollars inbound as well as part of this. Ms. Skinner, are you aware? I'm aware that in an escrow account there is a million dollars. Okay, now whether or not we get that, and I think we can negotiate, uh, hopefully with the owner, that we could uh, possibly get an advance on that as we needed it. It's for that purpose, and, and it's, it's money that is there right now, and we know that. So that's something that we would possibly negotiate on and uh, contingent on the owner saying yes. So one other question. Um, so 11,000 gets us to 10 to 20 years, hopefully 20, 20 years. 8, square feet. Is that what we currently have? What was our current square footage? I think it's about 11,000 on the original building, but the, is it 8,900? 8, the current. So we would be, if we don't expand to the 11,000, we're going to have the existing square footage that we have today. Right. Just renovated. And if we don't move now while the longer you wait on construction, the more expensive right. it's going to be. So if we do this again in six years, we're going to be paying. So at 3.7 million, we're essentially rebuilding the same facility just to the new standard. By going to 11,000 square feet, we're moving to the 20 year expansion capacity. Right. The, the, the uh, 3.72 million will get you an 8,000 square foot addition. Oh, addition. In addition to. So the it'll get up a 16,000. It'll give you 16,000. 16, and the other one will give us 19,000. That's correct. Which is the 20,000 square foot requirement. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. All right. So we got 8,765, at least that it took from your currently. We're expanding to 8,000. We need 11,000, but my math, that would give 16,000 square feet plus. Overall, is that incorrect? Okay, so there's eight <clears throat> there's eight thousand eight hundred square feet in the existing facility. So you have that that uh, square footage value, and we're adding eight thousand, which square would take feet. you to sixteen thousand, seventeen thousand square feet. And then if you did the eleven thousand square foot option, basically you're adding three three thousand onto that. So if you did if you did the eleven thousand square foot option, you're adding eighty eight hundred to eleven thousand. So that brings you up to around. 19 to 20,000 square feet as compared to a 16,000, 70,000 square foot facility. I believe if I remember right, our last meeting, you know, <coughs> we were told by everybody involved as the project was as is, we were told 20 to 25 years. We were good and everything was good to go. Now everything's come back to us yet again saying, well, we need more and it will give us 10 to 20 with no guarantee of 20. And with a goal of, I'm assuming 10, the way I hear it. If my recollection is right, when we were asked about that 8,000 square foot addition, I was asked that, and I was hoping it'd get us 10 to 20, but I wasn't sure. And a, lot of the, a few of the board members said, well, you know, you're not sure, and that's why we came back and um, came with this 11,000 square foot option, and we're 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 definitely sure that this is going to take us to the 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 20, uh, well over 10, but hopefully to 20 20 years. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to come back to the board in six to 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 12 years and say we need to 
uh, expand again. That's that's not the goal here. We want to try to get it done now. Well, what are you a no kill facility now? Uh, yes, sir. So what do you do with a dog that doesn't adopt or sell? How how long do you keep a dog? And what happens <coughs> to those animals that don't it, it don't, don't get adopted? It, it depends. And the, the thing is, is no kill is doesn't mean you don't euthanize at all. You do not euthanize for space. We still have to euthanize for. Uh, uh, severely sick and injured animals. We've got dangerous dogs that we cannot adopt back out to the community. So unfortunately, we do have to euthanize. However, if you're at a 90 or above uh, percent, uh, uh, 90 percent or above live le uh, release rate, you're considered no kill. Um, a lot of people uh, think that no kill means you don't euthanize at all. No, that's not the definition but we do not euthanize for space. So what do you do if you're out of space? Well, we've got a very dedicated staff and volunteer system, and we use a whole lot of rescue groups. We kind of wear them out, but we, we do, we've got a foster program um, that is uh, very successful, doesn't always work. They'll come back. Um, the staff works very hard, and... It's very easy and takes up less time if you just take the animal once you run <clears> out of space, take them to the back room and euthanize. That's easy. The hard part is finding these animals' homes, and the staff and the volunteers and the rescue groups uh, work tirelessly to do that. Um, we've got a great volunteer. I hope you've seen our, our Facebook. We've got animals on there constantly, um, not just for adoption, but the, uh, the successes um, that animals are find, finding <clears throat> homes. Um, so that's the programs that we have so we can uh, try to stay no-kill. Okay. Well, how, how much more, how many more cages are you going to get with 11,000 square feet compared to the 8,000 that we're proposing? The What 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 additional handling does that give you? Basically, what uh, you see before you right now is actually the eight thousand square foot option. Um, the floor, sorry, floor computer, please. Um, what you see here is the eight thousand square foot option, and if you notice, basically uh, the biggest difference is going to be your canine facility housing. So right here, you have approximately. <clears throat> All right, show me. You're gonna have to show me some okay. wiggle or something. But we go back to the and I can hardly see any of the writing on here. Right. So the biggest difference is going to be your your canine area in here. Okay. Um, each one of those is designed to be uh, basically a, a wall or a movable wall put in between it, so that it can serve as a double space, but it's not desired for any long term housing. So you're looking at one, two, three, four about let's say a maximum of of 20 canine spaces there under you know maximum con conditions for adoption uh, then you go back to look at the um, 11,000 square foot facility uh, not only do we have um, additional uh, space in here we have basically have the same amount of, of uh, adoption space we have an increase in the uh, the main dog holding the facility which is more of a, a you know a an adoption area for those uh, animals under long-term care and then we also have uh, dedicated court space so we're kind of redoing what's inside of the existing facility considerably more as well when this option is uh, right, what, to allow better flow what's dedicated court space that is for our court cases for our uh, dangerous dogs our nuisance animals um, and evidence uh, we have to hold those animals uh, to a court <clears throat> Unfortunately, at times, um, these cases uh, get continued, so we have to keep holding those animals until uh, the case is resolved. Okay, what do you do with them now? It, the, we have got the, the existing. We, we just do the best we can to hold them uh, on the, uh, the backside where we got the observation there and the existing facility. All right, so... So you're telling me, Mr. Loveday, when you went 
you up at the top there at your addition. Mm -hmm. This main dog room. Yeah, basically so with the biggest the there's biggest not chain one on the eight thousand foot. The main dog room in the uh, the eight thousand square foot ex uh, extension was uh, located within the existing facility, and it's something that, to note here with the. With the expansion to 11,000 square feet, allows you to move that main dog holding area out into the to the new space, um, and allows you more uh, space for the dog observation and dog isolation, uh, also your dog intake. So, those not only is a matter of looking at your adoption rates or your adoption, you know, your basically your clean animals, but also on the side of the, the animals intake for processing. So. Uh, the 11,000 square foot option only gives you more space for the adoption animals and main dog holding in the new facility, but that allows for expansion <clears throat> of the, you know, the uh, the intake side associated with observation, isolation, and intake. So uh, that's those areas on this side of the facility here that uh, gets expanded, and then also allows for a dedicated. Well, well let me ask you a question space. here, real quick, that you've circled. That's observation, isolation. Yes. And then dog intake. All right. What addition? How many additional do you get from the eight thousand to eleven thousand? Or do we have nothing now? Pretty much what you have now is you have the court case dogs uh, are put in with the uh, what little bit of a main dog holding area. So basically, it's the same generalized space. It's just re uh, rededicating it to the uh, separated corridors for That's court cases. That's where we keep the court cases right there. So it's getting the court cases out of the, the main, the uh, um, observation area, <clears throat> isolation. You notice here on this right-hand side, there's no dog intake areas, and that's one of the mandated requirements uh, that it would give us actually, I think there was about six dedicated spaces to intake areas uh, on this side in the 11,000 square foot option. So you're, you're adding in an additional capacity there for intakes. All right, and what uh, conference rooms and what what addition any addition to that from the eight thousand to eleven thousand? Any increases, decreases? The biggest uh, um, facilities in terms of administrative support facilities, you know, we do have a larger uh, multi-purpose area conference room uh, in the back corner right here. Uh, also, we are adding in public restrooms. In the expansion, which was not included in the 8,000 square foot option, that had to be construct that had to be used in the existing facilities, which is located on this side of the facility. Uh, it does allow for uh, the uh, captain and sergeant to have their own dedicated spaces with the animal control officers, also allowing to have them additional space. Before this area in the center uh, was actually like a, a shared administrative facility space with the clinic and you know support staff volunteers. Uh, with the deputies, which was you know not the best idea, you know not the not the most efficient idea, but it it worked within the space. But this actually lets them have their own dedicated uh, office space and docking stations for for their uh, for their work there in the in the facility. Also, it gives a little bigger room for the uh, shelter staff over here. They actually have a dedicated area where they can uh, have their uh, gear associated with uh, working in the facility. Um, and then also uh, it allowed for additional uh, visitation rooms and the real life real life facilities along the front side of the of the building. And for the multi-purpose room, why we? My understanding when I know when the public safety building was was built, that animal control was supposed to be using it as their where they stored stuff and where they met and did meetings and stuff like that. I know the, you know, <clears throat> most animal, most of the patrol folks are going to be on patrol and out and about or should be. So. Uh, the problem, Mr. Ben, with the public safety bill in there is absolutely no storage room. So. Uh, well, you're not going to be using a multi-purpose room for storage. We use you? any room we can. With next thing we'll be asking for is a bigger public safety building. I see now that was supposed to last many years. I don't know if that's going to happen. I wasn't involved in that planning. The, the multi-purpose multi room is just that, Mr. Benton. It's going to be used for training. It's going to be used for uh, 
not only some officer training uh, for the ACOs, but shelter training and um, for the animals. Um, we, we're getting a lot of activities. For example, um, we do a reading uh, to the dogs program where the kids come and on Wednesdays during the summer. We, we're making it um, uh, successful, but we don't have any room for that. They, they're actually out there on the sidewalk doing, doing projects, uh, promoting the animals. Uh, they got activities every week. Uh, it, it's a great thing, and we're making it work. But this new shelter, new space, would just make it work that much better. We're, we're making uh, a lot out of a very little, and what we're asking for is what we really need to make it work uh, sufficiently. I appreciate it. Uh, I just, I hate getting these these things at the last minute where you can't even compare hardly and, and we're spur of the moment making a decision. Um, like I said, I didn't get any of this before as far as this architectural diagrams and stuff like that and a whole lot of explanation. So at this point, I, I, I'm not going to support it right now. Okay. I'm going to go over to Mr. Yakubowski, but I know in our package there is not the 8,000-foot expansion. If there would be a way to tell us the difference in kennel space between the 8,000 and the 11,000, I know it's in the brief you're giving, but it's not in our package, so it's, it's hard. So I don't know if you can do that while Mr. Yakubowski is asking the questions just to see the difference in actual kennel spaces. Thank you. How long has this facility been there? <clears throat> we moved in in uh, March of 2000. March of 2000. Right. So we got almost 20 years out of it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's not too bad. It used to be over at uh, off of Lee Hill School Drive, right? Uh, yes. Okay. The old one. Yeah, and and if anybody was there and remembers what that was like, this this is the Taj Mahal compared to that one, um, and so uh, you guys have done an awful lot with the volunteers and with all the um, all the other animal groups that help out, and so uh, I, I was one of the ones that had asked about if if you're going to do it, you might as well do it now because your cost is less and you'll get more time out of it. Yes. And who knows? I mean, it, it might not be 20 years. It might not be 15. But the point is, is to at least build a facility that can get you to that point. And if we don't go with the 11,000, then we're guaranteeing not to even get to 20. Yes. And so I, I would say that we, we should go with the, um, with the larger facility and find the money to, um, to make up the difference. And I, I would also um, <clears throat> let people know that the service that you guys are providing is uh, is done very well. Uh, we adopted our second dog from uh, from there just a little while ago, and um, uh, fantastic uh, shelter dogs are the best. And I would um, also let you know that your Facebook posts do get passed around an awful lot. The videos get passed around. The portraits that are done by the uh, the portrait studio, the, the, the photographer that does that. Uh, so there, there is uh, a lot of that going around, and that will continue to, to build. My concern had been uh, going to a no-kill shelter, so you're not killing for space. You know, as we grow as a community, are we building it big enough? And I think that the 11 will take us, you know, certainly past 10 years. And like you said, with this one, we got uh, 17, 18 years or so out of it. So I think that that's... Um, that's the, that's the path that we need to go. And, you know, if, if we can come back with, uh, in the years to come, the multi-purpose rooms, perhaps we can upgrade those in year 18 for more kennel space at that point. You know, we can, yes. if, if you build the space, even if you're not using it to begin with, you always have the ability to, to uh, remodel and to turn it into something usable down the road. And so I, I think that we definitely need to go with that, and, and I think that we can find the um, additional money to um, to build it and to build it right. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Sibula. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I, I have to uh, uh, do a ditto to uh, Mr. Yakubowski's comments, but I remember two and a half years ago, I visited the shelter, and because it was written up, we had all kind of violations. We were under under threat of fines and so forth on a daily basis because our shelter was in such bad shape as far as the state was concerned. And I think we've come a long way, but we still haven't satisfied those complaints as I understand it until we do in fact build the addition to this shelter. And that's what a lot of people are forgetting. This was a project that has been under underway for almost three years, uh, establishing our, ourselves as a no-kill shelter uh, was a, is a, a fine goal, and, and we've gotten there. Uh, we need to continue to do that. If we don't expand this shelter and, and do the best we can, and at least for a 15 to 20 year uh, goal, then we are not doing our job for the animals in our county. And we're not doing our job for the people who have animals in this county. And we're not doing our job for those people like Mr. Yakubowski who wants to adopt animals. We need to have a facility that is capable of people coming in and being comfortable to visit these animals that are up for adoption, a place where they can meet with these animals that are up for a job adoption so that you get to know them, uh, get to love them, and walk out with them. Uh, we're forgetting all of this in, in terms of space and a, and a little bit of money here. We have, we're, we're a thousand, I mean a million dollars short now in budget. We have the potential of 800 and, and some thousand dollars uh, to supplement that, and we're looking, we're looking at less than uh, uh, $200,000 to complete this project and do it right, and do it right now. And, and, and uh, that's what we need to do, and I'm going to support this project to the utmost. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yep. A couple things I just want to point out, and, uh, and I agree with both Mr. Yakbaus and Mr. Sabula in uh, support of the project. Uh, a couple things. Uh, we have the full million. We have eight hundred thousand in pocket. The rest is will be. It, it will. The rest. The rest of the million will be here, shortly. So I think we're comfortable with having the full four point seven two million that we'll need. Uh, it, it, Mr. McLaughlin, just to be clear, uh, the proffered money comes when we get occupancy permits, right. and you know, we just had a public hearing uh, for proffers that weren't paid because the right. construction project fell behind. My understanding, these so, are probably going to be paid a little. They are apartments. These are based on apartments, which go up a little quicker. Than yeah, I would they, they have this. submitted one site plan, yeah. and as I understand, there's another site plan yeah. coming. But but the, the just, money should be in battle. I feel more comfortable with that. And, and one thing, you know, we're throwing around the big numbers like 3,000 square feet, 11,000 square feet. I just want to point out, 3,000 square feet is not that big. This room is probably more than 3,000 square feet. So when you put it in perspective, it's not that much more space. It just sounds, when you start saying 16, 19, it's really not a lot of space. And I think we should take advantage of the opportunity today while we're <coughs> under construction. If we're building eight, let's build 11, make sure the building carries out to 20, for the next 20 years so we don't come back and do this in 15. So that's all I had. Yeah, Mr. Batten. Well, like I say, we don't have money in hand. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have a whole lot of things for this county. Uh, we just tried to do a school budget that we couldn't fully fund. And now we're talking to people out here saying we're going to find a million dollars. Well, I wonder what kind of, uh, for the citizens sitting out there wondering how the county is going to find a million dollars. <coughs> you know, that would trouble me when we can't even fully fund the school budget and uh, have the school uh, teachers raises and stuff like that. So that's what's troubling to me. And like I say, not getting all the information and now having to make a split-second decision as far as what I'm, in my opinion, I have trouble with it. And I, I'm not going to support it at this time. 
I've got a couple questions. So we have had an 8,000 square foot facility since 2000. And do you have any data? So it sounds like it's met. I mean, obviously we need to renovate that and that's part of this plan too. And an additional 8,000 or 11, or 8,700 or an additional 11,000, correct? So either 17,000 or 20,000. So do we have any data that shows, and I don't know, were you able to, Ben, during during that time, look up the actual kennel difference? And, and like Mr. McLaughlin said, we're talking about a small space, but it is a million bucks. So that's my concern is you've got 3,000 square feet at a million dollar cost, and how many additional kennel units are we actually getting? Were you able to do that? or? Yeah, if you can uh, give me the floor computer, please. This is uh, taking a uh, rough look at the expansion <clears throat> differences. Um, basically, uh, the, between the 11,000 square foot and 8,000 square foot, this is, this is what your canine space is. The, the feline space is about equivalent in facilities. You have about the same number of adoption spaces. Once again, it's 20, but it's, uh, that's if they're, they're, uh, the <clears throat> movable wall is placed. Court case, uh, based on the demand, is, is five. That's equal. Uh, it has an additional two spaces for observation. Once again, that's, uh, I guess that's associated with the animals, making sure they're healthy to enter in general population. Isolation, you get an additional two. I think those are for the, for the really sick animals that come in. Uh, intake, uh, intake is the biggest difference because right now, uh, basically uh, we have no intake space more or less in the existing facility. Uh, and would we carve out two spaces in the 8,000 square foot addition to meet uh, state code. Uh, in the 11,000 square foot addition, we'd have an additional basically six. So you have an increase of four intake spaces uh, between the two options. And the puppy space, which is you have to have dedicated to the, the puppies that are brought in, uh, we have three spaces in 11,000 square foot addition compared to two, which right now they're in with the general population, which is, I don't think that's the, the recommended course of action, but it's the best we can do at this point. Uh, and also the visitation rooms. Uh, those are where uh, folks come in and, and meet and greet the animals or if they, they have a situation where uh, they need to see an animal brought in. Uh, we have three spaces in the 11,000 square foot compared to 8, 000, one in the 8,000 square foot. And that's like I said, this is just your, your canine related spaces. Uh, like I said, the difference is we still have additional administrative space and support space in, in between the two units. Yeah. So it looks like <clears throat> and again, I know we get more than, but it looks like 11 spaces total for the million dollars additional. I know we get more than that. We get, instead of reading outside, we get to read inside. And, and I do appreciate everything you guys do. Well, it's hand. more than that. We've, okay. we've got a lot of dedicated feline space, which <clears throat> we practically have none now in the new shelter. I mean, in the... Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, shelter we have now, uh, if you've been there, you'll see that our <clears throat> lobby is full of cats. And that's where we gotta keep them. Um, so a lot of this, um, and there are other areas for dogs too, this is just the runs, but we've got the other rooms that are, are gonna be used for dogs, the visitation rooms <clears throat> and things like that. But uh, a lot of the new space is gonna be for our dedicated feline because um, our cat room now is very insufficient. We, we have uh, sick cats quite a bit. That's why we've got to try to separate them. And, um, and that's why they're out in the lobby, uh, because, so they can have room. Because if you've been back to our cat room, there's just a small cat cage, <clears throat> and that's where they're at. So that's, that's a lot of the space that, that's in the new, too, is the feline space, which is very important. So can you show me on the floor plan, or the floor plan only show the, the canine? Start with the 11,000 square foot option. Uh, in, this, uh, in this option, the, um, options pen, here we go. Uh, basically your <clears throat> cat tower areas, your feline holding areas are located in here and then along the shared wall with the existing facility is where you're gonna have your, uh, your main areas for your, your cat, cat general population. Uh, the cat isolation remains the existing facility. Once again, that's to make sure that you're keeping <coughs> the, the two populations uh, separate. 
Uh, we actually would have a uh, dedicated tech cat intake space, which we currently really don't have. Uh, we'd actually have a cat quarantine, which is something that's not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. ideal in the existing facility. Also, the cat <coughs> isolation will be over in the existing facility. Uh, once again, kind of separating the, the, uh, the uh, basically the intake population from the general population, at, uh, to use two terms there, is basically your right-hand side, the existing facilities maintain intake, uh, and then the left-hand side will be general. The, uh, the 8,000 square foot option, uh, basically what you have is a cat tower area in the front corner mm. of the facility. And then you would have the man, main cat room in the rear of the facility. And then the existing facility, uh, you do no longer have a cat uh, um, isolation area back in here. That's kind of has to be replaced with your dog intake, which is your two spaces of reference in the previous slide. The intake is adjacent to that with the cats, <coughs> uh, which is in this location. And then the cat observation isolation moves to this, this area up here. Um, there's, once again, there between the two options, there's not necessarily a big difference in the, the, the feline population management. Okay. And the cat, cat intake is used for just bring, when the cats come in, you process them and check them over. And, okay. I, guess, I guess, again, I appreciate everything you do uh, for our dogs and cats, and I think it's a great thing, a great service you provide to the county. But it looks like we're getting about 11 canine units additional for a million dollars. Um, and that, yes. go ahead, Sheriff. That's $90,000. That's, you know, I understand that's a lot that. of cash. But one thing we keep talking about, the animals. But we've worked really hard to get volunteers to work at our shelter. And the people that volunteer don't have a place to eat lunch. They don't have a place to hang their hat or their coat. And as Mr. Sabula said, he toured that facility. And when you walk in the front door, there are literally cats everywhere because we do not have the space. <clears throat> we only, not only need to take care of our animals, but the people that work in that shelter are some of the most dedicated people I've seen in a 50-year career. And they go above and beyond to serve the public to take care of our animals. If you look at nothing but cost, if we can get 20 years out of 3,000 more square feet, to me it's a good option. Mr. Benton mentioned the public safety building. Public safety building could have been planned a little better. We have no space, we have no closets, and I can sit here all night. I'm glad that we have a nice new building that the heat works in and we've got rid of the rat problem. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we want to be honest about it, let's just be honest about it. But looking at the employees that try to work in that facility, there's nowhere to park, there's nowhere to walk the dogs. The volunteers come down to try to walk the dogs every day and there's nowhere they can even take them for a walk. It's parking lots and roads all around it. So it's antiquated, it's dangerous, and I think we need to move forward. So I do want to ask a follow-on question. So with the 8,700-foot option, would there be a place to walk the dogs with that or, not, or still not? Basically, the, uh, the plan is in both options to, there's an existing stormwater facility behind the building. Uh, we're actually looking at filling that in yep. and actually creating a <clears throat> fenced area that could serve as an area where the the, the canines could be released or however they want to manage that that, uh, that <clears throat> area. All right. All right. Thank you, M uh, Mr. Yakubowski. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question about um, cost, and our attorney left, so our um, county administrator, if you could answer this for me. This was part of the 2014 bond referendum that listed several items in in the um, in the bond. Um, is there anything that prohibits us if we have a cost overrun on an item to use that same general obligation bond to make up the difference and thereby maybe pushing something off the list or reducing the cost to something else? You said that was on the 20, 
14. 14 referendum, <clears throat> which that would, I would have to defer to Carl that with that question, it's going to depend on the precise language of the question. And I've, that's a question I've, I've not seen, Mr. Yakubowski. I apologize. I don't, okay. I don't well, know the terms of it. Maybe I can filibuster until he gets back. The, the part of it is um, we also had a 2002 bond referendum for uh, fire stations. I believe that you had worked on Mr. Taylor at that point. And I understand that the wording might be different. But if the wording is available, that extra million dollars could be borrowed because we could have another item on that same list that would be uh, perhaps we could we could save money on something else there so basically if you have 10 items on the on the request with a set number of dollars one runs over one is under you know you you can't borrow more than the amount but divvying it up can also always be changed I would assume and I guess that wasn't long enough for Here he is. well there is Here that is. danger okay. when you assume Carl, yes there is form of bond referendum questions Carl and right and so I, I had a question the um, uh, it was question number three on the bond referendum of 2014 that allocated <coughs> Um, or, or didn't allocate, but it, it referenced $36,388,641 to provide funds together with other available funds to undertake a program of capital improvements related to public <coughs> safety, including but not limited to the following projects, animal shelter, GPS, equipment on safety vehicles, um, yada, yada. There's a, a bunch of items in there. My question is, since there's a set amount of money for a set amount of projects, if one has a cost overrun, you can always borrow more for that if it's listed in the bond and perhaps decrease it from another part of that bond issuance. Or could you, is if, my question. If I understand your, your, your question, um, the, the referendum question is to tie whatever is borrowed under that amount, the $36 million, to those projects. Right. Um, so if one of those projects you know, needs money from somewhere else, I, I don't see any limitation in that language that would not allow the, 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 the board to fund that, uh, assuming that it's gone through all the required appropriations, you know, other requirements. There's nothing in the, the bond question that limits um, the funding to just that amount borrowed. Um, it just, but it does tie, you know, any of those amounts borrowed, you know, are tied to those projects. But it doesn't limit, you know, you, can't, you can certainly take money from somewhere else um, if you want to fund those. But um, obviously the, goal, the idea is, you know, you fund them with the, um, the amounts. But I, I, don't see, I don't see anything that prevents it just based on that language. Right. So I, mean, I, I can't give a real definitive answer. I just, based on what, you know, he's right. So, so basically if you have 10 projects in a, in a bond question with a set number of dollars, you can spend that set number of dollars on those items that are listed in there, even if you had assumed that one of those items was going to be a certain price, but the price runs over. You can spend more on one and less on another. You just can't spend more than the total number that was the question. Right. Well, the question ties those funds to those projects. Again, you can still fund those projects with, with other funds, but that, that $36 million, you can't move anywhere else. It's got to be, you know, for the question stated. And I, I think it's right. certain projects, and I also think there's also some language that allows for a little bit of wiggle, wiggle room there. So, Right, but we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we don't right. have to do all 10. We could do nine. If, if nine was the same cost as 10, we could move one off and then do them all with the same amount of money, is my point. Basically, can we borrow the money out of this bond question that of the overrun for the um, animal shelter? Money set for taking, what he's saying is, is, if I may, Mr. Chairman, what he's saying is we've got 10 projects, we've got $36 million to do it. We could actually take one project, and as long as all those 10 projects or nine projects, or whichever ones we decide to fund, we should be able to um, use that $36 million. So right. I was saying, let's say we fund all 10, we could take 100,000 from nine of them, have $900,000 to use, in addition to what we'd fund for the animal shelter program. Right, right. right. You, so you can, yeah, you can, you can move that money around between projects, yes. you know, based on that language, yes, just based on that <laughs> language and not looking at anything else. Yes, I mean, 
Thank you. I, I apologize for talking a circle. Right. It's not. It's not. Okay. It's not line items. As, as far as I know, it's not lined item out. It's. It's a. It's a lump sum to be spent on those projects. I. I just like to say that first of all, I think when you look at kennels and you say you're you're looking at three thousand more feet and what you get for it. Well, remember, there were bathrooms associated with this, and there were office spaces that they don't have now. And I do have been down there before we even considered doing any addition to this, and it's it's critical. I mean, it is, it's it's not something, I think, to Spotsylvania County standards, and we need to improve on that. And the 3,000 additional feet that we're going to ask for this, I truly believe will get us through the next 20 years. And that's what one of the big concerns was. We started many years ago when we started, we had a $13 million Taj Mahal. And we said, we can't afford that, so let's break it down and see what we could get. And then we came back, and just a little history, we found out that that extra money, well, I was the one that brought up and said, I think we can do it cheaper. And, and we did some investigation. We found that the price, the realistic price of what was based on things happening in Stafford County and people doing that. So that's why we're down to this. And again, I, I wish that we wouldn't just concentrate on kennels because there's more to a no-kill shelter than just the kennels. And, and we say one of the things is we, we, will, we will have more dogs probably adopted by having a nice place for a family to come in and sit down and play with that puppy dog or whatever it might be. And there probably is nothing better than a kennel, uh, a shelter dog that is probably friendly and everything because what we do at the kennel is we sort of put those mean dogs out to the side and, and see if there's any way to salvage them. If not, and then we take other dogs when we get a little crowded right now and give it to our volunteers and people who search for people who are, are looking for a pup dog and stuff of that nature. So at this point, I'd like to make a motion that we do approve. We do approve the, um, the presentation, the plan uh, for the, I believe, 47, 4.7 million. It, the, the deficit of a million dollars added to what we had originally, and that we accept the plans for 4.7. And if you could give me the exact numbers, I would do that. Basically, it would be we have $3,722,131 total in the project, so we'd be looking for uh, a new budget number of $4,722,131. Basically, it's a $1 okay. million dollar increase. So that, that is what I'm making a motion to accept that new price for that and go forward with a, uh, a kennel that will last us for at least 20. And there's nothing to say it won't last us for 25 years either. Okay. Any other discussion? So, Mr. Skinner, just to clarify, that's an 11,000 square foot addition. That's an 11,000 square foot addition to bring it up to between 19,000 and 20,000 square foot. Any other discussion? Call the question. Five yes with Mr. Ross and Mr. Benton voting no. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, thank thank you. you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think Susan's up. Right. I thought this was going to be a short meeting. <laughs> going quick. While she's getting settled, I'll offer fair warning. There is a very short but necessary additional closed session following regular programming but it, it can be done in five minutes or less. I promise. Okay, I heard Mr. Taylor say beers for everybody <laughs> if he can't do this in five minutes or less. So Mr. Ross, um, this is the, uh, the work session on the uh, uh, Citizen Budget Review Committee uh, bylaws and also the attendant if the board wants to take it up, uh, appointment of, uh, of Don Knapper. Um, obviously this, 
is a work session for you all. Um, I just offer a couple of thoughts as the way you know we we thought it might run. Um, obviously, we we want to get the direction from the board as to you know how you want the citizens budget review committee to be made up. Um, obviously, that's the the main issue um, here tonight as to you know whether the school employees and county employees uh, can be on there or not. Um, and then I think Susan will, will get direction from you all. And then based on whatever that direction is, we would come back you know, with uh, those changes um, for you all. It, we think it could probably be on a consent agenda based on the fact that you know, we have a majority of you giving that direction. But of course, if it comes on the next consent agenda and you want to pull it off and discuss it even further, you can. So uh, with that, I'll let, I'll let Susan go ahead and, and, and start. And that's it. Button. My apologies. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what I should say. We sent out um, an email with the timeline and the history of the CBRC. Um, I've written two memos it, on what we think the current state is. I will say that I think that uh, Carl and I agree that the, the current state of the bylaws is confusing, and however you want to do it, we want to fix it so that it is clear, so there's clarity for anyone looking at it. I'm happy to answer questions if, if on, the, guess, on the timeline. I guess I'll start off just asking you to do a quick overview. So I believe there's some key words both in our charter and our bylaws about county employees, school employees, and then a lack of addressing constitutional officer employees. Um, if you could give a right. background on that as well as the may, should, shall right. sure. thing, I think it would be good for the public and for the board to review. Sure. The, the, uh, the current um, CBRC charter was adopted by this board in, I want to say, yeah, um, June of 2013. And the CBRC charter states that the, uh, in Article Three organization, it says members of the committee should, should be citizens with prior expertise in public or private sector budgeting, comma, who are not current employees with Spotsylvania County or Spotsylvania Public Schools. Now, there has been some discussion, if I could just stop right there, the way we would read that is that the should <coughs> carries through, so this is a, a, an aspirational document saying it, this guidance is aspirational. Should be citizens, uh, shouldn't, you know, who are not current employees, of Spotsylvania County or Scots Spotsylvania Public Schools. Then the bylaws were originally adopted at the same time, and they are more specific. The original ones, I'm sorry, um, that were adopted on March 20. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. It's not March 24. Here we go. The bylaws stated under section 2.1 composition, a member shall be a citizen of Spotsylvania County and shall not be a current employee of the county administration or the school system. So there's a significant difference between the aspirational um, who are not current employees of the county or the school system to shall not be a current employee of the county administration or the school system. Then in 2014, that was amended to if you just look at the amendment, it took out shall shall not be current employee of the county administration or the school system and said may not be a current employee of the county administration or the school system. And that's part of what I mean in the clarity in that switching from shall to may doesn't, if you're just looking at that in isolation, it doesn't provide much meaning um, because what does it mean if you may not be a county employee. Um, but in looking at the history and looking at the um, the minutes of the Board of Supervisors, the minutes of the, the CBRC, um, the, the direction that went to the Board of Supervisors along with that change, it was clear that what was intended was to allow a current school employee to become a member. And it stated that the change was to remove the prohibition. So may not was to remove the prohibition. So that's how we interpret the current state, is that changing from shall to may 
in, in accordance with the board, board's stated intent, remove the prohibition on um, county administrative employees and uh, school board employees. Now, we get back to the sheriff's office, we, the employees of constitutional officers, it's interesting, as we say, the bylaws amendment is very specific, excuse me, the bylaws as originally drafted were very specific in that, and different from the charter, in that they said a current employee of this county administration, and actually the county administration is a separate di division of the county. So we interpreted that just to mean couldn't be an employee of the county administration, could, could otherwise be a current employee of the county outside of administration, the Department of Administration. Again, that's, you know, that's the way we interpret it, the way it's written, but it's your committee and your bylaw, you know, you can have it say whatever you want it to say. So I'll just throw out to the board for, to start our discussion. It, it, I don't think we need to get focused about the should, shalls, or, or needing a legal a law degree in order to, to do those. We just need to decide, policy-wise, do we want county employees on the CBRC? Do we want school employees on the CBRC? And do we want constitutional officers on the CBRC? And whatever we decide upon that, then we give it back to our attorneys to make it clear uh, that that's the case. So there's no, because I, I know if a layman reads this, they're like, no, you can't do that. but but you can. So I'll open up discussion with that. Yep, Carl. Yeah, that's, that's exactly um, I, what we would recommend, that you, you tell us what you want, we'll paper it up to make it so, and we'll make it you know, much more clear so even the layman should be able to understand it. Okay. All right, Mr. Benton. I think probably most can guess them on how I feel. I don't think any county employee, and that incorporates everybody, should be on the CBRC. It's just, uh, it is a conflict, uh, whether they can provide information or not. These are supposed to, this is supposed to be for citizens. Yes, a county employee can be a citizen. Um, and in my opinion, the sheriff's deputy is a, is a county employee, no matter how you look at it. Uh, but, <laughs> I'd go back to the original charter from the original board and the intent, I think, there is clear. This should not have any county employees on there. And when I say county employees, I mean <coughs> school, utilities, fire, rescue. And as we've already seen a little bit or heard in, in conversation, you know, I'm sure if we're going to allow everybody, I'm sure fire would like to have a person on there, utilities. <coughs> I mean, where do we stop? Um, and as far as an elected official, you know, <laughs> somebody with the sheriff's office better be very careful if they're going to get on there and start criticizing. Because they start uh, causing problems between departments. That's their job. Because the sheriff can certainly come <coughs> in and say, have a good day. Um, and I don't think that's fair to that employee, number one. Until such time, that's changed, which I doubt will be ever. But, uh, you know, it's, it's for our citizens out there who, you know, to pick through, to do their own due diligence uh, and ask the questions, not having a whole bunch of information to influence or sway a committee or board, which they can certainly do. Um, you know, it's it's for the for the novices out there. Not um, somebody's going to take that word. Novice understanding of the county, maybe, and to come in and and, and ask the questions that are, are critical, and to for us to stand up and and be transparent, which is the favorite word these days, and uh, provide the information and be open with what we do and how we do it and where we're ta where our money's going. Uh, Again, I, county employees should not be on there, uh, period. They can sway, influence, and also get them themselves in trouble. And if you don't think a supervisor out there will, will do something to an employee that will, is critical of either their own department or the county in general, and we've had other county employees out here that 
are very critical, calling us names and everything else. We're, we're, I mean, yeah. Careful for what you wish for. Dr. Trampy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know how many of us were conscious that changing from shall to may was removing a prohibition. I'm pretty sure, I know for myself, I didn't look at county administration or county schools and think, oh, well, that doesn't include constitutional officers. So I guess my question to my fellow board members is if we change this now, what happens to the sheriff's employee, who, employee who's already there? Are we going to kick someone off who is already there, who was unanimously approved by this board? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would recommend we set policy first and then talk about that. It'd just be my recommendation. I have Mr. Sibula and then Mr. Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was the first person to be nominated to serve on the, the newly formed Citizens Budget Review Committee way back when, first time around. I served for a couple of years as the chairman and uh, the Board of Supervisors saw fit to dissolve the committee in absentia without, with a friendly amendment and the committee went away and I continued with the original members of that committee with a citizen's budget watchdog committee so that we still continued to review the county's budgets. Back in 2013, I believe it was, the exact date, the uh, board saw fit to reestablish the Citizens Budget Review Committee. I was again appointed to that committee and served as chairman until I submitted my resignation when I decided to run for county supervisor. During the time that I served on that committee, we had people come in from schools, we had people come in from, from the county, we had people come in from the sheriff's department, all of them to ask questions. We invited all the major divisions to send people to the committee so that we could ask them questions at the committee. And at, during that time, it was my judgment that it would be nice to have somebody from the schools. It would be nice to have somebody from the Sheriff's Department. It would be nice to have somebody from county admin. And there were no bylaws and there, were no, there was no charter to deal with at that point in time. And now we're arguing about who can and who can't and shall and will and so forth. Uh, I nominated a, a deputy sheriff to become a member of the committee because he had budgetary background. And that was the original criteria for being on the Citizens Budget Review Committee was individuals with with serious budgetary background. That was so we could look at the budget and make recommendations. Now we have a school person who is being recommended to be on the committee. Uh, I personally see nothing wrong with that. Uh, while, I, while I served on the committee, I also served on the school's administrator's budget review committee. And they found that helpful. I found it helpful. It was giving the budget, the total county budget, a good review from citizens in the county, no matter where they were from or what their job was. They had the budgetary background to look at it. I don't see what all of the problem is, the, the, the wills and the shells, 
We now have a person on the Budget Review Committee that works for the Sheriff's Department. We had a person on the Budget Review Committee that worked for the schools, uh, voted unanimously to be on. Uh, we have someone that works for the schools now that wants to be on the committee. Uh, I see nothing wrong with it, and, and I will vote to support that individual, and I will vote to support having anybody that wants to serve and has a budgetary background, no matter what their job is within this county, so long as they're a county resident. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. McLaughlin. Yeah, I just want to point out a couple of things. And, you know, the, the title in itself, Citizen Budget Review Committee, and the intent was for citizens in the community that could get in depth, you know, with the experience. And we do have a community with vast experience in budgeting because of the, our location of the federal government and, you know, the acquisition communities that we work in. But the, so the problem, you know, we get is that the idea is to have a citizen that is unbiased. And the problem you have when you have somebody that works for, whether it's the county, or the schools or a constitutional officer, there's always gonna be some level of bias because at some point or other, you're reporting back through your chain of command. And it's very difficult if you work for an organization and you recommend cutting the entire budget, or you're potentially cutting your own budget or your peers' budgets or your boss's budget. So there's always gonna be that perception of not being unbiased. And that's the thing that we want to avoid is any perception of being biased. And that is the, the biggest thing that we need to take away from here is that if there's any perception of a biased opinion in our Citizen Budget Review Committee, we're failing in the mission of that why we have those folks. And there was a good example, and I brought up earlier today, um, the old FREM Commission. We had members from the volunteers, and we had paid firefighters on the uh, fire commission, and they were essentially setting policy for the fire chief to um, execute. The problem is some of his firefighters were on the commission were giving their boss direction. That doesn't work because it puts that, that employee in a bad position. So they may not make the best decision. They may make, make the decision that's, uh, I'm not saying they wouldn't, but it puts them in a position that we don't want them in. We have plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of citizens out there that can fill these roles. I don't think that we should have county employees on the Citizens Budget Review Committee. Mr. Chair. Mr. Skinner. This is your second time, right? No. No, oh, okay. No, All right, it's just a late night then. But. That's okay, sir. Right. Not a big deal. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to know, and, and when you talk about budget experience, um, you know what, when you take anybody out there in our community today, they have budget experience because they run a household. And there are many times that I've sat in this board where I've heard members here, well, we wouldn't do it in our home that way. Why do we do it now? Why would we do it as a candidate when we don't run our own home that way? We have citizens that come up to that podium and say that. And so I'm not sure what, what degree of budget experience you have to have because you work for a military organization. And I will tell you right now, 20 years or 40 years of my experience in the military, half those people should be fired. And that's the truth because there's so much funding wasted out there under government contracts is not they really have no uh how, how can i say this but no responsibility they just do it and 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 they don't think of the consequences and stuff like that so i'm not sure that because we have some military people and contracts out here work with that, that that's a really um thing that i would say um is a budget criteria what I do say is that every citizen out here has to run an annual budget every year with what they do. Our seniors, and we've heard so many times that the seniors, you know, we want to make sure that we don't hurt them. There's people that have low income that we don't want to hurt them, but they're all running. So I think anybody actually in this county, um, if they really want to make a difference in here, I think should be allowed on it because one way or the other, everybody has budget. Um, and I think when we have people such from the school system, when we have from the police department, and I gotta tell you the first year that I was on this as a supervisor many years ago, it was something that some supervisors would come to me and say, does the school really do it this way? And saves a lot of time. And I think what the, our, 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 
budget committee should be doing is, you know, instead of having to wait for an answer from the schools, and whether they have somebody on there that's knowledgeable about how the school does is a big, big benefit. And the same way with the police department or our, our EMS or our, our firefighters and stuff of this nature. I don't think it's about someone being forced. And I don't think we have the leadership in any of those departments whatsoever that would say, well, because you said this, I don't want you around here anymore. I, I just don't. That's not the organization that I see, okay? I think we've got great leadership in, in the fire department. I think we've got in the police department, um, EMS, everything that we have. And I, I would say that it's important to have that knowledge uh, because I think budget time is very critical. Um, we need to have those answers quickly on, on the committee. And so I really don't know why we're doing this uh, and we're worried about it. I mean, it's, it's I, I would also, mentioned the fact that um, of the budget committee recommendations in the last four years, how many have we actually accepted? I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just trying to put the facts out there. And when you talk about bias, I mean, uh, without saying it, when there's, uh, you know, there's certain members that are associated with groups out there and, you know, we know what their goals are and, I'm, you know, I think the word bias should be left out. I don't think any anything whatsoever should be uh, party-wise, whether it's any party whatsoever should be involved in this. What we want to do is what's good for our citizens, and I think a, a person that runs his own household is probably sometimes smarter and do a better decision of making budgets than people that work for military contractors and stuff of that nature, because there is no accountability whatsoever in our government today for funding and budgets of that nature. And I've got the experience and I'll be happy to show you where people are working that shouldn't be working. So I think we should have an open. I think it's stuff that we've we've heard over the years and we've modified it. I just, I wanna see an open discussion with everybody involved and therefore I will support um, having uh, uh, members of whether elected uh, officials, I don't know how many elected officials would actually be on it I mean, it's not my desire to be on a, a budget review committee. I've got to make the decision why would I do that to begin with. Um, and I'm not sure how many other elected officials within this community would do it. Um, but uh, I think it's very important to have the experience also with the departments and what really goes on there and how they have it. And I will have the faith in our leadership that they're not going to hold somebody responsible because, you know, this is the way they see it. So I, I will support a system that allows anybody to be on this budget uh, committee. Thank you. Mr. Jakubowski. Thank you. And thank you to, um, to staff for looking up all the information and the history of the CBRC, which was the CBAC, it was an advisory committee. And at that point years ago, um, looking back on the minutes and everything else that were um, from many years ago. The purpose, and I don't think the purpose of the CBRC has changed. I think it is about finding savings, finding ways to spend taxpayer dollars in the most efficient way possible. It is about transparency. It is about having people looking over our shoulder and I don't understand what the issue would be of having somebody who actually uh, is is part of the organization on the on the CBRC. I'll, I'll note that we actually did <clears throat> put on a uh, substitute uh, uh, school teacher um, a couple years ago. I do believe I don't have that in front of me. I apologize, but a couple years ago, I think two years ago. Um, and yet that flew, that flew through without any problem. Uh, a couple of things that were raised. Number one, um, where does it end if we want to have fire and rescue and, and um, every other department uh, seated on the CBRC? Well, uh, it ends at 10 because that's a limit of people that we can have on there. Uh, each of us gets to a point one and then there are three floating positions. And I, I think that we can 
have people on there that would be interested in serving because that's what this is about is serving mr skinner made a note that over the past few years how many recommendations by the cbrc have actually been adopted by this board and actually in fact how many recommendations have even been brought forward by the cbrc you know we we disbanded the edt um for confusion and also because it was taking up too much staff time. Well, I really wonder how much time the CBRC is, is using up and with what results. I mean, if, if we're not going to even, if we're not gonna take their recommendations and use their recommendations, then why have them making recommendations to begin with? This past year, there were well over 100 questions that were submitted to the school system. Um, and in fact, questions coming back from our finance committee uh, just a couple weeks ago, after we already presented the budget, uh, answering some questions that I think were pretty important to the budget process. The budget review committee, in my estimation, if it's not going to have people from all areas of the county and county um, uh, departments, if, if you choose to be uh, appointed, or if you choose to appoint somebody who does work for the county, I no problem with that. Uh, but we also got to look at the charter, and the charter says that you have to have budget experience. And one of the reasons for budget experience, in my opinion, is so that you have people that know what a budget looks like when they're sitting down to look at the budget and they don't get up in here and uh, insult not only our uh, school division, but then also our outside auditors claiming that things had made it through that shouldn't have made it through, uh, which I think is, um, is completely out of line. And that's not criticizing somebody for, for volunteering. What that is doing, in, in my opinion, is having that person go many steps beyond what they, what, where they should have. It's one thing to say that you don't answer, or emails have been sent to the school system and they've yet to be replied to. Fine. But then it's backed up and, and added on to with a, well, it seems to be that that's their, uh, that, that's typical of them, something to that effect. Those type of, of um, comments are unnecessary. And then bias. Are you kidding me? I mean, take a look at what the CBRC is looking at. They're looking at the IB program. And actually there were questions on there about having international travel as part of it. This is how they had no idea what it was, but yet they're, they're targeting it and going after it. My question is, where'd that come from? I have an idea. I'm not gonna share it publicly, but I have an idea. Because it's brought up specifically by people that are on those committees that want that to be looked at and that is a bias. So, you know, if, if we're going to start deleting people because of the organizations that they belong to, well, I have a list that I think that we should put out there. But I don't think we should do that. I think that's wrong because, again, we can be able and should be able to be part of many different organizations, wear many different hats, and contribute to the community that we live in. And, and to say that there, there would be some type of, of um, uh, undue influence. And again, Mr. Benton, I have, uh, it's completely legal and lawful and 100% above board that you were a, a Spotsylvania County employee. And I never question your ability to make decisions that you were biased. You were making your decisions and I never questioned why you were making them. I might have questioned them and we have a debate and that's fine. But I never question your intention behind them. And I don't think that we should start because when you start doing that, it's never going to end. And I don't think that that's a road we should go down. So I think that we should have uh, anybody who wants to serve on there, uh, it, it, it could be perhaps, and this is something I'll float out there, every board member gets one and then there's three that we can appoint. Those three can be prohibited if you would like but I think every 
every supervisor should have their own choice when it comes to the budget review committee and who they put on there, and especially because we've already put on a substitute teacher before. Thank you. Okay, I, I would uh, like to make a correction, Chris. There is There are only seven members right now. It's not 10. So I um, uh, just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention, and I, I very verified that. I do have uh, the charter up right now, and I think one thing when we're looking at policy, we do need to go back and look at the purpose, and Article 1 of the charter does give the purpose which I'll read out loud because it's not that long. It is the intent of the Board of Supervisors to cause to be established a committee of seven citizens for the purpose of independent, I think independent is a key word in the charter, review of annual budgets and financial issues identified by the Board of Supervisors and to provide recommendations regarding that review to the Board of Supervisors. So that's the purpose as per the charter Article 1. And the mission statement, the mission of the budget, Citizen Budget Review Committee is to review the county administrator's recommended budget. So if, and again, I've got some other points, but I do think if you're a county employee, there's some perceived pressure that uh, you'd have to be double guessing Mark on his budget if you were going to recommend anything other than what he does recommend. And the school superintendent's recommended budget, which again, I think we brought it up. We, we've heard the word bias, but we haven't talked about conflict of interest. For me, it would be a huge conflict of interest to go against my boss or my boss's boss's budget, whether I'm trying to get less money or more money, or if I find something, I would have a, it'd be a very big conflict of interest for me personally to go against in my company, my boss's boss's budget. I don't know if everybody's worked for somebody in the the past, if you would feel the same way, if you've had a, somebody you've worked for and you're going to uh, come out with a recommendation uh, different from your boss's boss's budget, uh, I think you'd think twice about it, regardless of whether it's perceived or real. Um, so I'll finish this. And the school superintendent's recommended budget to ensure the Board of Supervisors' priorities are met in the most cost-effective manner. The committee will make recommendations including potential budget adjustments on spending county funds and reports to the committee's findings to the Board of Supervisors. In addition, the committee shall review and report back to the Board of Supervisors on financial issues that arise during the fiscal year as directed by the Board. I do think this year we took the CBRC's recommended some, some recommendations by increasing the Sheriff's budget. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. Or we did increase the sheriff's budget based off of the committee did, the CBRC did recommend some increases in some yes. areas, correct? So it's not that we haven't ever accepted, it was said that we've not accepted things from the CBRC before, and well, we have. Um, so again, I'll go back to the conflict of interest. If you think, if you're a Spotsylvania County resident, you're out here listening, if you can think of, of, of bosses you've worked for or their bosses, and you think you'd be in a good position to make recommendations against that boss's budget, I, I think you're going to have a big conflict of interest. Uh, the CBRC, we just talked. I just talked about the purpose and its mission, and it is either going to ask for additional funds or it might find some cost efficiency for things to be cut. So that's part of their job. The other thing we haven't mentioned is just your coworker and peer pressure. I can't imagine uh, being a county employee and, and working in a department. Uh, full of peers and making that recommendation to cut a position in the department I work in. Uh, I would be ostracized, I would think, with my peers. Uh, and maybe not. Uh, maybe we have county employees that wouldn't do that or school employees that wouldn't do that. But I think it'd be very difficult position to be in, again, because of a conflict of interest. We're not really changing anything tonight. And again, this is not about an individual. It's been brought up that it's about an individual. It's not. It's about a policy that we have, and we're going to be cleaning up all our bylaws and looking at all our policies, but that is very unclear. If you read it, you would think right now, if you didn't know the history that Susan has done an extremely great job of bringing up, you would think we could not have a county employee you'd probably think we couldn't have a constitutional officer and you would think we can't have a school employee on our CBRC right now. So we're just trying to clear that up. So I don't think we're really changing anything. This was set up by intelligent people, I'm sure, in the beginning. They, they thought about it. It was before our time. We did reconstitute it. 
And we did, the board, uh, the, at least four of us, uh, did reconstitute the, the charter and the bylaws. Um, so I'll just throw those things out there. If there's any other discussion, get Mr. Yakubowski. Thanks. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, two points. Um, actually, it is 10 people, and you voted for it, too. Um, February 11th, 2014, uh, we increased it by uh, three at-large members. I uh, passed unanimously with Mr. Skinner uh, voting for it. So we do have those extra three positions there. Well, then the charter needs updated for that. Well, but uh, see, and, and this is kind of my point here, is that we're going back to the charter now. And and I also do have a question is, is uh, y you keep referring to our boards and commissions being looked at and, and I'm just wondering who's doing that, who authorized that, and where did that come from? I think we brought it up quite a while ago, and Carl was doing that. We've, we've discussed that as a board before, too. We have. Have, have we taken a vote on that? I'm, I'm curious. I, I just I honestly don't, don't remember this board asking staff to take a look at our boards and commissions and, and clean them up, because this is, this is very new to me, um, having this uh, question come up, because there is a pattern that you can see here over the years of the charter all of a sudden now comes back into play as, as the guiding uh, principle, the guiding document to this whole thing. And yet it's been violated multiple times because the, the charter also does say that you need to have uh, public or private budget experience. And Mr. Skinner pointed out very well you know, what does that mean? In my opinion, it means that you need to have run a budget. Running a household budget, that's the way I interpret it, running a household budget does not equate to public or private budget experience uh, the way that I read it. And, and in that regard, I would say that the at least three uh, of the resumes that I read tonight of current members, um, they shouldn't be on there because they don't have budget experience. So if, if we're going to change the charter, which I, I'm not sure if we want to or don't want to, but I, I think what we need to do is get back to the purpose of what the CBRC is. And it is to give direction to the board of efficiencies and, and areas where savings can be found. Uh, I went and looked at the um, presentation that was given that was just cited that um, the recommendation was taken and uh, the CBRC recommendation was Sheriff Department likely requires a budget increase. Okay, that's, and, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into that sentence, but what does that tell you? I mean, on, honestly, they, they, they should get a budget increase and they shouldn't get a budget increase. Thank you, really? I mean, those aren't recommendations. If that's what we're looking for in recommendations, then continue on with this thing. But what I am looking for is specific things that we can do and having people from the outside that have public and, and or private budget experience running budgets. The original one had Mr. Cibola, Mr. King, uh, Ms. Heidegg, and others on there that ran big budgets that knew what they were looking for, or, or looking at, I should say, and looking for. And that way, they could then compare their experience to what this budget looks, looks like and ask the questions that need to be asked. And if we're not trying to get to that point of finding savings, efficiencies, and, and ways to do things better, I'm not sure what the committee is set up for. And, and I would just say, too, that, that to question whether or not somebody could sit on the CBRC as being a county employee and not feel pressure or or vote against their their boss's budget you know if they ask to be on that committee that is then up to them then it is up to this board to decide those recommendations that are given to us whether or not we want to take them put them into practice or ignore them or ask the CBRC to do other things if, if we think that there's a, an avenue that needs to be explored but I, I, I really don't like prejudging people's decisions that they will be making in the future based upon criteria that you might have. 
I feel completely comfortable with a school employee sitting on there as one member of the CBRC, giving her input and, and uh, giving her um, uh, perspective on what the budget looks like, why things are done. Geez, I wonder how many of the questions that were brought up at uh, February's meeting could have been answered. We're just having somebody there explaining what, why football helmets are taking on the instruction uh, category. Those type of things, I think, is what we need to focus on. And whoever we put on the, the budget review committee to get us to that point is who we need on the budget committee. And, and simply cutting it off because they work for the county or for the school system, I don't think is going to be beneficial to the board. Mr. Chair, um, just for uh, Mr. Yakubowski's uh, benefit, the. Um, Obviously, you know, having to extrapolate and put, you know, different versions of bylaws together is, is an ideal. And, you know, we've, we obviously came across that here, and there's a couple other times where we've been asked to look at something where it's been difficult, more, certainly more difficult than it should be to, to determine um, and uh, interpret some bylaws. So it, it's an ongoing project of ours, and we hope to uh, come back um, with cleaned up bylaws across the board and with the committees. Um, you know, work on the, uh, extensively over the summer, come back sometime in the fall so we can have discussions and be prepared that the next organizational meeting to clean everything up um, and have, uh, you know, very clean uh, bylaws and committees and, and have everything set out so it's very much, much more easily understood. So I just wanted to update that. Mr. Batten. And Mr. Yakubasi, as you just heard from our county attorney, that's what was said in one of our meetings. I don't think any vote or conversation was held on it. I'm sure you had opportunity to comment if you didn't agree with having him look at all that stuff, but almost verbatim what he just said there is what he said earlier in one of our meetings. Um, you know, if we make these changes, you, <laughs> I think we're, we're going down a wrong road and going to make this committee basically defunct and probably a laugh, laughing stock because nothing's to say that each of us could not appoint a county employee. So why not just have all county employees on the budget review committee and add a couple more with the three that you found and just have all county employees doing it. Because, uh, and Jeremiah, if you're watching, don't take this to heart, but certainly I could ask Jeremiah to step down so I could get me and a county employee on there and so could everybody else. Or for that matter, maybe we better sit back and just, if if we're not going to listen to the recommendations, which there have been recommendations made, and he did make more recommendations than uh, in his recommendation for the sheriff's office, he did expand on that quite a bit uh, in his conversation. And I believe cars was involved. I don't know what else, but uh, if we're not going to follow the recommendations and what they find and bring to us or investigate it further, which they've brought other things up to us and we've done nothing, then why have it? Maybe we ought to consider getting rid of it. Uh, if we're not going to follow them and, and we're going to start getting away from our charter, and no, I, I, when I was uh, first elected, I, I was just put, trying to get people to fill these committees and and everything. Uh, nobody brought to my attention any charters or that I had to have specific criteria for this person or that person. Maybe a little guidance uh, in that department would be helpful, uh, especially to a newly elected person uh, who's basically having to make decisions within the first month or so. Um, so we better be careful about what roads we're going down. And that's one of the problems here. We, we don't even follow our own charters. We, we start making all these changes to stuff without actually going back and stepping back and, and looking at the original stuff and what the intent was. And like I say, careful for what you wish for. Uh, Mr. Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just concerned about one thing here that really bothers me, and that is as we speak and everybody speaks about, we talk about a department. We talk about the school division. We talk about, uh, you know, an admin, someone from the county. Well, what I'm concerned about is are we denying this person because they're associated with an organization. And I don't want to do that. I mean, if a person is going to volunteer for this, they've accepted the fact that they may have some 
you know, let's say the superintendent's budget. Maybe they don't agree with all of it. Or maybe that's what the committee is for, is to look at that and give that outside impression. But what I've heard tonight is basically um, people shouldn't be from the fire department, people shouldn't be from the police department, people shouldn't be from the school division. And I don't think that's, I, I'd be a little concerned about the legality of that. Even though there are facts that you said, Mr. Ross, tonight, that there may be, it may happen. There's no doubt about that. But the fact is, it's you, we're we've been or we are associating it with a particular organization, and I don't think it's legal to not permit somebody on a committee because of the association with one of those organizations. I'd be very careful with that, and certainly one thing if if decide that a certain representative from the school district can't be on the committee, then we've got to be consistent throughout the whole thing, okay? But again, I'm not willing to say anybody can't be on it, and I'm not willing to say because you're associated with that and you may have some pressure from the superintendent. Again, um, you know, I, I think if you took a look at the sheriff and the fire chief and you take a look at the superintendent, I think they understand what the budget review committee is for. And I would hope that they would respect that position, whether it's in favor or against of it. So I'm just concerned about associating people with organizations. Thank you. Right. Well, Carl, could I get your legal opinion? I don't think there's any legal question about the policy that we had, in fact, and have kind of changed a little bit as far as not a, ha, seeing it as a conflict of interest and not allowing school employees to sit on a committee. They're still welcome to come to those committees, but there's no lega, legal issue with that. No, not, not as far as the makeup of um, the Citizen Budget Review Committee. I think uh, uh, Supervisor Skinner was maybe speaking maybe towards uh, the individual that, that is up for appointment. And we haven't looked at that in, de in depth, so I, I, I'm not prepared to give any and, opinion and, on and that. And Gary, as you were speaking too, and again, I have a huge conflict of interest concern, but there are other places. For instance, we have two members of our board that are government employees. They can't be a delegate. Right? They can't run for a Senate seat because of their job, because of the Hatch Act. So that's just another example where people are limited by their occupation, by their job, and I'm not sure of the Hatch Act origination or why it's set up that way, but it is. So two of our board members can't run for delegate because of the jobs that they're in for their daytime job. Just something to think about. Mr. Fenton? Yeah, last time I opened my mouth. Uh, and you know, this board needs to think why don't we see the county employees coming in here and speaking? Other than budget time and for raises and trying to speak professionally on that, why don't you see employees coming and speaking to us on various topics of interest? I can tell you why, because they're county employees and they don't want to lose their jobs. And if you don't think a sheriff's deputy can walk, walk in one day and, and put his foot in his mouth and not be there the next, I hate to tell you, it happens. You know, we don't see a lot of our employees here speaking on matters of public interest. And think about that for a second. Why don't we? If they are citizens and have all this rights to come and speak to us however, however they want, why not? Because I, I tell you, as a county employee, there's been plenty of times I've wanted to come speak and say my piece. But I knew it was at stake, and I was smart enough not to put myself in that position. So we're opening up a couple uh, a can of worms here, and I, I, I voted for Mr. Briner, or First Sergeant Briner. I did. But I'd put out some feelers also, and I knew everybody else was going to vote for him, so I voted for him. That was my mistake. But you can go to him now, and you can ask him if, what I had, conversation I had with him. And I told him I was against it. I did not believe in it, did not want it. But, you know, everybody was for it, so, so be it. But think of that. How many employees do you see coming before us? Really, think about it real hard. And there's plenty of issues where our employees were very concerned about policy, ordinances, and everything else. They don't sit out there and comment. And I, I'm pretty sure they probably don't call you. 
Okay, Mr. Jakubowski. Thank you. I have one last comment. Um, we all do know that the uh, school system has their own budget review committee too, and you have employees that sit on there too, and, and they do challenge the superintendent. And if you want to see it happen, you should go to one of their meetings and, and check it out. This 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 fear that is out there of one person sitting on the committee that is somehow going to, you know, uh, I, I don't even know what they're going to do except use their background, experience, and thought process to make recommendations. You know, you, you, you want to sit there and say that the Sheriff's Department, that the CBRC came up with a, with a litany of stuff for the Sheriff's Department. Yeah, why, why don't you read it? You know, I mean, it, it, no offense to them, but, you know, if you're looking for recommendations telling us that the Sheriff's Department is reusing old equipment, oh, good, I'm, I'm glad that they are. Where are the recommendations? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really not understanding the purpose behind not having somebody that can provide that type of insight. And I think what Mr. Skinner was referring to was at last meeting, there was a reference made to Ms. Knapper and her association with the uh, Teachers Union, which is a professional organization. They don't um, bargain, and so it's not a right-to-work state, if I have to remind anybody. So there's no forced unionization whatsoever. It's a voluntary uh, group. And there were comments made by board members here that we don't want that on there. And I'll tell you, it, you start going down that road, that's the road to worry about, not the road of whether or not they're employed by the school division or the county or the sheriff's office. It's when you start looking for other associations that people might have, and because you disagree with them, you're going to hold that and prejudge those people of what they're going to do and say. Whether they're outspoken or not, doesn't matter. But they can wear different hats. They can do and serve on different committees, and I think that they should be allowed to. All right. Uh, any other discussion? I, I just want to say one thing, and, and Mr. Benton, uh, if there is fear of reprisal in this county, then it's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. And if you don't know of the problem, you can't fix the problem. And so there's a lot of things out here that not only uh, our employees, but our citizens feel about the board too. I mean, take everything into consideration and you've got to say, well, you know, a good example is, and it's said before, is when we do an advertised tax rate, it's, there's no, you know, it's gonna be at the level rate and what it's been in last, but, it does us no harm whatsoever to raise it a couple pennies in case there is there is uh, you know information that has really been brought to our attention that we could think about. So a lot of citizens, it's been said by a lot of people out there that um, they don't come to the meeting, they don't come to the county meeting because the uh, the budget hearing uh, there's no there's no objective. It's set what it is. It can't go any higher. And and believe me in leadership in the Marine Corps our open door policy is and I think we've all been there person asks me what I think I tell him the truth and he goes well that's fine but we're gonna do it this way and but at least it got an opportunity to speak and stuff of that nature I if we truly have that type of problem and you're aware of it then we need to fix it sir we really do and unless we have an opportunity for someone to do that and that means that we as a board need to be very um, concerned about if a employee or something comes up here and speaks something, it speaks, speaks his or her mind, then we need to keep an eye on that employee just to make sure that there is no retribution done to that employee. And I think that way um, we get a county that we can be proud of and leaders that we can be proud of. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yep, Mr. McLaughlin. Motion to clarify the bylaws that state CBRC membership is restricted from county employee, school employee, constitutional offer employees, and open up to citizens. Okay. Any discussion? Carl? 
Uh, just for clarity, um, so this will be to limit um, the CBRC to, to just citizens and shall not be a, a county employee, a schools employee, and by definition, a county employee in school. Um, that also would include any right. constitutional officer, meaning sheriff, Correct. treasurer, commissioner of revenue, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I just wanted to be, be Correct. clear. Mr. Skinner. Would you clarify what happens to now the uh, deputy that's on the committee, sir? Well, I would... Uh, after, I would after, go to have him to step down. Yeah, correct. The second one. yeah. But yeah I, I think that discussion was next. Yeah, I think you know once you make that policy decision, you would have to determine what to do about the current uh, member who is constitutional or. Yeah. So before we make a vote, before we make a vote, we want to vote for it and then discuss it. I think that's before you make a vote. You better well, make sure that whoever you've appointed. I, I think we need to set the policy, Mr. Skinner, and the, okay. that that's the first thing, and then discuss if we want to grandfather it or what. I mean, it it, it seems like the policy to me would be the overarching um, decision that we may need to make. All right. Any other discussion? I will call the question. Three yes with Mr. Yakubowski, Mr. Sabula, Dr. Trampy, and Mr. Skinner voting no. Okay. And we need a, another motion to clarify these bylaws and charter. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we remove the item in dispute of being a county employee or school employee. And again, just for clarity, this will open it up to anybody, no limitations as to employment with um, county administration, county schools, uh, constitutional officer. True, so. but but it still does come back to this board for a vote on that person before they're appointed. Oh, to the oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the appointments stay the same. It's just respect, just with regard to that limitation. And and Susan, please feel free to jump in if I'm missing something. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? Call the question. Four yes uh, with Mr. McLaughlin. And no, it's a no vote. All right, Mr. Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. Ross, and Mr. Benton voting no. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that Don Knapper's resume for appointment uh, and motion for appointment to the CBRC uh, be made. I, I'm not sure. I'm looking to um, Mr. County Attorney because I voted for it and it was voted down last time. I think I think it was continued last time to this meeting, so uh, it, you would move to the for the board, move it for the board's consideration. But I voted against continuing it. Well, it's 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 okay. continue, it's it's done. Okay, it's so done I, to be I, continued here today. I mean, it's 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 yeah, okay. Yeah, it's on the agenda. Okay, I'm just so clarifying. You, you would just move to have it considered. Okay, okay. make any, that motion. Any discussion? Call the question. Four yes with Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. Ross, and Mr. Benton voting no. Okay, and I think that brings us to closed door. Again, five minutes. I just want to double check, Susan, did, do you have what you need as far as direction? Okay. I believe so. Okay. All right, this will be a uh, uh, second resolution to adjourn into closed meeting, whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors desires to adjourn into closed meeting for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, specifically the Chief of Fire and Rescue and Emergency Management, and whereas pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711-A1, such discussions may occur in closed meeting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors does hereby authorize discussion at the, of the aforestated matters. Seven, yes.
resolution, whereas the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.23712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors hereby returns to open meeting and certifies by roll call vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion convened in the closed meeting were heard discussed or considered in the closed meeting. Mr. Yakubowski. Aye. Mr. Sibula. Aye. Mr. McLaughlin. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Dr. Trampy. Aye. Mr. Skinner. Aye. The chair, aye. Mr. Chairman, board members, based on discussion in closed session, ask the board to entertain, please, a motion to waive the residency requirement in connection with the promotion of Jay Cullinan to the position of fire chief. So moved. Any discussion? We'll call the question. Seven yes. Okay. Any other business tonight? Do I have a motion to Motion adjourn? to adjourn. All right. Call the question. I didn't have board comments, but I didn't want to say that those guys did a